So, uh, did anybody see any good horror movies recently that are like sequels to remakes? Um, you know? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I think so. Because I know that uh, no one I may have seen this movie you might have heard about called uh, Evil Dead Rise. I don't, no. I don't oh. think I've ever heard of that movie. <laughs> I, well, I saw no. that when it came. I don't know if I talked about it on the podcast, but I I saw it when it came out. Oh really? Well, now it's, that we've all s- talked about it, it's a per- or now that we've all seen it, it's a perfect opportunity for us to all talk about it. It totally probably is. for the first yeah. time live on air. Right, we've never talked about it yeah. before. We've never talked about it at all. Um, so mm-hmm. I mean, what what did you think? How'd you like it? I liked it a lot. I I might call it my favorite Evil Dead. It, it's Whoa. that good, right? Mm-hmm. It's really good. I really liked. So I saw, <laughs> I saw a um a Tumblr post because I was doing my Tumblr thing where um someone was like screenshot an article that said Evil Dead Rise is great trans moron er- representation. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> um and and I fully agree. Danny is one of my favorite characters I've seen in a, ho- a horror movie recently. Yeah, and he's mm-hmm. dumb as hell, but in the right way. Yeah. He's dumb as hell in a way that I can kind of get behind. Yeah. Very teenage boy dumb way. Um, love him for that. Loved all the siblings, honestly. I liked their dynamic. Yeah. I saw an interesting review recent about it, though, um, from a reviewer that I uh, often respect but sometimes disagree with. Your movie sucks. Because uh, he was he was he he liked this movie, but he did not enjoy that there was a younger child character because he thinks that um, if there is if it's obvious that there is no danger to the young child character, then it sh- then that character should not be in the movie. And he felt like this movie really fell prey to that. And he at no point believed that the kid was in any danger. That makes and I sense. I kind of agree with him on that one. Yeah, I get I, it. He's like okay. in a movie because. He had um, talked about A24 movies right before that. He talked about Hereditary and another. He was talking about um, Bo is Afraid and he mentioned Hereditary. Mm-hmm. And he's like, if a movie is by a director that usually does weird things um, and there's a chance that the child could get injured, I don't mind there being a child character. But if it's a big Hollywood like movie uh, in a franchise, I really don't expect the kid to die. And this was a p- real problem that I had with Evil Dead Rise. I'm not going to lie. My thing with Evil Dead Rise, I feel like that actually might be a little spoilery if I continue my sentence. So I'm not going to say anything. No. Okay. Yeah, okay. The movie is like new enough that I don't want to go into any details on that it front. I That's almost more of a said something we'll as well. Thing. Um, not thinking about how we're live on, <laughs> on recording. Right, right. I think it's cool when kids die. <laughs> Wait, when this children on? die. Yeah. Um, So I had a fun game for us now that uh, we've all seen Evil Dead Rise and have talked about it. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. I watched Evil Dead Rise the weekend it came out uh, with my brother, Daniel. Hi, Daniel, if you're listening to this. And he posed... Hi, Daniel, Daniel. if you're listening to this. He posed a fun question that I would like to extend to you all. Okay. Okay. Okie dokie. As I'm sure we're all aware, Evil Dead movies generally happen in like a cabin in the middle of the woods, kind of. Right. And now Mm -hmm. with Evil Dead Rise, it happened in like an apartment complex. So if you were in charge of the next Evil Dead movie, where would you want it to be? Like what sort of fun setting would you give to it that you think would be great for an Evil Dead movie? Well, here's the thing. If I'm going to put it in the line of Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead Remake, you know, Mm -hmm. Evil Dead Rise. No, wait, I need to cut one of these. Uh, If I put it in the vein of Evil Dead 1 and 2 being the same movie, Evil Dead Remake, Evil Dead Rise, that means that by my logic, this is the fourth Evil Dead that would come out if we're ignoring uh, Army of Darkness. Mm -hmm. And as we all know. The fourth movie is a great time to jump the shark and go to space. Shit, dude. Oh, Hellraiser so went true. to space in four. Evil, Evil space Dead in space. Lepre- I think Leprechaun went to space in four. Okay. Yeah. Jason waited a respectably long time until his 10th movie his tenth to go to movie. space, yeah. but we don't need to do that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Evil yeah. Dead mm-hmm. in space. Yeah. Yeah. That's now, a good one. Wait, 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 though. Wait. Before you wait. get started, clarifying questions about Evil Dead in space. Okay. Of course. 
Are they on a yes, planet it's a or Next is question. it a spaceship? Of course it's a musical. No. That's not even a question. <laughs> no, it would definitely be on a spaceship. Okay. Okay. I would want I mine like on this. a boat ship. I want mine on a boat ship. Okay. Oh, I think that... okay. So my brother's answer was a cruise ship. And oh, I was like, oh, ship. that'd be really fun. Okay. So that I, would I be could get with that. Fun as well. N- Nina, An what evil kinda... dead movie on like a Disney cruise, that'd be <laughs> That'd be so amazing. good. Wait, what kind of oh, what kind of theme park? Thinking, Evil though? Dead in a theme park. Oh, that would just be like the um, ending of Zombie Land. Yeah, uh, and, true. Um, I think that uh, and Hellfest, and like Hellfest. an old, an old, um, like like you know that new Dracula movie that's coming out that I really don't think is going to be that great. Yeah, um, Renfield, where it's like no, that, <laughs> no, the one on the ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, um, I. I would like an Evil Dead movie on a boat like that. Maybe yeah. do another time travel one. Um, yeah, I could get into that for sure. I think that having having the Deadites on a ship would be interesting. I would love to see how they would deal with that, for one thing. Yeah. Uh, how do dead Can Deadites sail? If they managed to take over the ship, where would they go next? Um, <laughs> they could fly. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, well the, I think the answer, can Deadites sail, is answered uh, sort of indirectly in the movie Army of Darkness, which is that so? <laughs> counter to a lot of the other Evil Dead movies, rather than taking place in the, the traditional location for an Evil Dead movie, like an apartment complex or perhaps a cabin in the woods, um, mm-hmm. Army of Darkness takes place in medieval desert England. Oh, that's true. It is medieval desert. Yeah, it's not what regular England looks like. It's definitely a desert, but it's England. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen clips. So is it England? Because I kind of got the vibe. It was supposed to almost be like a Crusades kind of deal. Oh, perhaps the there's literally no humans in the movie that aren't British, though, is the thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Except for just like the Crusades. (laughs) Just like the Criterion. <laughs> Jesus um, Christ. But like the Deadites in that one operate a bunch of siege equipment in a sort of uh, Siege of Helm's ah. Deep kind of situation. Well, that, that is true. So okay, I'm pretty so they sure they could handle a, 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 a sailing ship. Yeah, I think they could manage I just, that. They could manage a, a spaceship, lot of I dare say. <laughs> there's a lot of slapstick um, possible oh, for, oh. Uh, <laughs> for for deadites. It's a pirate ship, a uh, pirate crew a pirate, becoming okay. deadites. Pirates we got of the deadites Caribbean skeleton hands. scene. It's the Pirates of the Caribbean skeleton yeah. scene on the Black Pearl, yeah. except instead of you know the comic relief characters scrubbing the deck and stuff, it's just a bunch of deadites, and it's a lot <laughs> less funny, but it's a lot more funny at the same time. They're doing the I same stuff, the just their that. motions are a lot more like herky jerky looking with the beat of the music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're also, um, they're also swearing like oh sailors. so much, oh, well, so much. They're so and, like, much. The Honestly, is one could say them. they're already sailors. They're already they sailors, already and now they're sailors. deadites. That's twice the swearing for half the cost. So yeah. true. I'm so starting true. to think that's the best idea. Honestly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be really great. Pro- <laughs> Crossover with Horatio Hornblower. Oh, there we go. No, not with the Horatio Hornblower (laughs) again. I swear to God. I'm so excited to watch those eventually. The Deadites would make a lot of jokes about Hornblower's name for sure. Of course. A hundred percent. Okay, so that's that's. Thank you for the question, yeah, that's Dan, who is not here. Yeah, thank you, not um, here. I didn't get to say mine. Well, I haven't. Oh, said Emma, one what's either, yours? So. Oh, Jeff, yeah. what's yours? I, Jeff, you you go first. How do I come up with a good new one when the best ones have already been taken? Pirate ship, spaceship. What else am I? What's left? The moon. Okay, then oh, I shit, will the answer. <laughs> I will answer mine. So this is a deep cut. So okay. I think we go back in time. Um, not to when you would expect Mesopotamia in the early church, oh. they used to call together these large, basically conferences of theologians to talk about, um, theological issues within the church facing the church today. The first major one was called by emperor Constantine and had some <laughs> heavy hitters there. Now that we have established that church bullshit doesn't work on these people, yeah. I would love an early church <laughs> theological summit where they have to deal with deadites. Okay, and I've got want- I've got the setup for how the deadites get involved in the Council of Nicaea. We we play into the like uh, the mythology of the Council of Nicaea, which is where people think that it was to establish the canonical books of the Bible. 
And mm-hmm, while they're going yeah. through all the manuscripts, some guy holds up the oh, fucking Necronomicon and he's yes. like, should we include this? And everyone's like, what the hell is that? And he's like, <laughs> and, I don't know. And he opens it up. Somebody starts reading from it and they're like, I don't know. Should we include that? But the room is already transformed into Deadites. I have a question yeah. uh, for all of us. Okay. Yeah. Um, for every everything we've we've proposed so far, all three. Is Ash there or not? Of course Ash is there. Oh of my. course Ash is at the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> Why would he not? Okay. Invited. Wait, 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 no. Ash is not there, but Bruce Campbell does play the Pope. <laughs> oh yeah, that's better. Yeah. And he's yeah. he still does his like shitbag voice the whole time. Well, as obviously. The Pope. You don't hire Bruce no, Campbell no, and then have him not is... do the voice. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is going to come had. to the obvious conclusion that Ash is the Pope, though. And also, did they have a pope no, when they, the council? No, they no, didn't. I didn't think yeah, so. I don't think they had that. Oh, fine, the yet. Emperor Constantine or whoever the hell you said. It doesn't yeah, matter. Emperor, <laughs> oh. Emperor Constantine would be like that big figure. Yeah. Um, and honestly, if if um, Army of Darkness does take place during the Crusades, it almost makes sense for him to be like the Emperor Constantine too. It totally yeah. does, actually. Hail to the king. What? Who do anyway. we email about this idea? Sam I think Raimi, this is a great sure. idea. Sam Raimi, yeah. obviously. Yeah, if anyone's going to make a bullshit-ass movie like this, it would be Sam Raimi. Hey, Mr. Yeah. Raimi, we have a proposal for hey, you. Yeah, if you're listening. Fuck whatever Marvel's asking. Yeah. Sam. Sam um, Raimi. Sam, and can you tell Ted that I say hi? Thanks. <laughs> Love Ted <laughs> Love and Coraline. <laughs> the movie he didn't know he was in. Um <laughs> <laughs> We got any ghouls, or are we just going to roll into the episode? No, nah, I think that was the big um, thing. I have one ghoul. Okay. I watched a movie off. that uh, a couple of you may potentially have heard of, but you probably haven't. It was called The Devil's Reign. It's from 1975. Jeff's out here scouring the depths of Shudder's bullshit this, ancient ass okay, movies. Okay, this movie <laughs> is insane. <laughs> William Shatner is in it as like oh my God. an unimportant character relatively. Okay, but here's the big thing about oh, William Shatner. Oh, because this is when he's like, just on the up and coming uh, tail end of like this Star is Trek, post huh? Star Trek, so he's definitely like kind of a, a a deal, but he's not like huge. You know, you know, he's not Billy the Shat like we know him now. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But in this movie, he gets crucified upside down by Ernest Borgnine. Oh my god! Ernest Borgnine plays the villain in this movie. I've never seen him as a villain before, but he's actually kind of incredible. Oh my god! But here's the problem: the problem is this movie is an hour and twenty five minutes long, and it manages to drag because it is so no. slow moving. The plot is so simple, and there are so few like important events to it that it's like it's that short, but like it it doesn't have a lot going on. But like it's. The whole time that I was watching it, I was like kind of into it because it's very like um, you're gonna hate this. It's very Lucio Fulci esque ish. Oh my I fucking knew you were god, Jack! It, it, I'm pretty sure that when Lucio Fulci decided to start making the Gates of Hell trilogy, which is um, City of the Living Dead, House by the Cemetery, and then The Beyond, or actually that might have been I might have got the order wrong there. It doesn't matter. Um, those movies, I believe, are very similar to this one i i have not watched house by the cemetery or the beyond in their entirety just yet but i have watched city of the living dead and the flow of it is very very similar to the devil's reign it kind of seems like he was trying to do that kind of thing again but just like mm-hmm. better yeah <laughs> yeah emma knows what i'm talking about full aficionado yeah. that she is i love yeah. old movies yeah as we all know especially <laughs> with william shatner yeah oh. You know, since since Jeff snuck in an extra gab, uh, I would extra. like to mention one as well. Okay. Oh, my God. OK, uh, I watched High Plains Drifter. I actually Yo! watched Hang 'em High, High Plains Drifter and Pale Rider. I watched Hang 'em High, but I watched um, Pale Rider a few months ago. <laughs> High Plains Drifter is such a fucking mean movie. Is it? I forgot how mean that movie yeah? is. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the quick summary of it would be. Um, town sells its soul to the devil to protect itself from its own, like, oh, actions. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Wait. I think I remember this. This is the one where he, like, to defeat the, the what, the gang that's terrorizing the town, yeah. they, like, paint the whole place red and then fight him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember yeah. parts of that. But Pale yeah. Rider, Pale Rider's the one where he arrives in that, like, mining town and he's just, like... People Hello, rise up, man. seize the means of production. Yeah. You have nothing to lose but your chains. That's that's the one, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. He's also a pa- and he fights capitalism. A lot of people <laughs> refer to Pale Rider as the angel to High Plains Drifter's uh, devil because he is a very not good person in High Plains Drifter. Yeah. And it's really cool because this is the kind of guy that they would be running out of town and they do try to run him out of town until he kills their hired muscle for messing with him. Ah. Uh. And then they're like, oh, would you like to be our new hired muscle? Because <laughs> our an other <laughs> older hired muscle that we railroaded on a, a trumped up gold thievery charge, they're coming back and they're kind of mad at us. Uh-oh. It sounds like this town so he hangs is around very and... bad at selecting their hired muscle, right? Like, Well, the, they didn't need the hired muscle before, but, you know, some happenstance happened and their marshal died. We don't need to go into it. Sure. It's really good. Huh. It's really good. It's really gritty and dark. Um, you, you'll want to look up a like some maybe content warnings before you uh, jump into it because sure. it's a it's definitely a gritty one, but it's very good. What about Hang 'Em High? How you feel about that one? Mid. Okay. I fine. remember hating it when I watched it, but that was like 10, 20 years ago. It wasn't twenty yeah. years ago. I wasn't seven years old watching Hang 'Em High. I was gonna say <laughs> no, but it was at least ten years ago. It was at least ten, probably closer to twelve or fifteen. But yeah, no, Hang 'em High was fine. It's like it simultaneously dwells on some areas way too much while fast forwarding a lot of very important information. <laughs> it feels like there there's a really good story in there if they mm-hmm. wanted to if they wanted to make it a spaghetti western treat, and give it an extra 45 minutes. Oh, sure. I, I feel like if they wanted to treat everything with the level of seriousness that they treat one scene, maybe it could be good. But they spend so much time on a hanging scene, like really making it like built up emotionally and like building tension. But the rest of the film just isn't that deep and oh. isn't that well maintained. So it's like you have one good scene near the end that really drives home kind of the system that our main character is involved in and like what that means and like what that means to the people around him even people that he liked and wanted to save and the rest of the movie is just kind of there (laughs) the rest of the movie is just kind of happening and then it gets to this one scene where it stops still and is like how do you feel about this like emotionally and i'm like i don't know man (laughs) so far you've been like i'm on a quest for revenge pew pew right right yeah well, so, but the important question, one. how high did they hang him? Not very. Like, God what, three it. feet off the Shit, ground? <laughs> that's job. not true. He was on the back of a horse. That's a minimum of four feet. Okay. At but the least. other guy was that's able not to high. get him that's down high pretty enough. easy. Yeah, because he, cause he cut the rope. He dropped him. Yeah, but he didn't have to, like, climb the tree to cut the rope, did he? Yeah, because the rope was tied to the tree. Oh, yeah. True. He just went, like, whack. Yeah. Well, but like, okay, yeah. in any case, him, that's not hanging. Brought him, him back to life and said, high, that's... "I might hang you again, but I'm gonna do it justly." Oh, and yeah. drags him to prison. Uh, How okay, kind of so yeah. Anyway, that's uh, the Western Corner. Ao. Nice. I have one movie I'm gonna gab really quick that I forgot about. Okay. Oh, oh what is God. it? I saw Fast X yesterday. Yo! Oh my God! Oh, seriously? Is, is it good? Is that everything <laughs> you'd expect? Oh God! Is it? Is it Vin? It's Vin. Um, oh. It is. <laughs> Perhaps I I know they went to space in nine, but they 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 did. They did go to space in nine. This is perhaps the most ridiculous. uh, That's a high bar movie. From what I gather, it is a high bar, but some wild shit happens in this movie. Yeah. Um, Does the street win again? (laughs) Not wild in the way that they go to space or like go underwater or something, but just wild bullshit of like, I can't believe this is happening right now. You know what? Um, Good. Yeah. So (laughs) if you enjoy the fast movies for the dumb fun that they are, this is definitely continuing that trajectory. But if it's not your thing, yeah, it's not going to be your thing. I personally still haven't seen anything beyond Tokyo Drift, actually. (laughs) I haven't seen any oh, of them. Oh, after Tokyo Drift is when it really starts getting into like yeah, that's when it starts to get like Fast and Furious has become. Yeah, yeah, it starts to get stupid in like the fun way instead of the stupid of the first three movies where they're just like dumb, not great. They're not. Yeah, yeah I didn't. I didn't really enjoy them. It was fun to laugh at them, but not a second time. I would say four is when it starts to get good, but four itself is still 
okay. Mm. But then five, it gets really good. Um, Emma, I don't think I knew that you'd keeps... seen all of them. So I, <laughs> great question. <laughs> um, I stopped at seven, which uh. was the movie where um, Paul Walker died during like filming. Oh. Um, so I saw that. It was really emotional. Fantastic movie. One of the best in the mm. Fast franchise. And then I hadn't kept up with the other three that had released since then. Okay. But then my friend and coworker M, who I see a lot of movies with, was like, hey, do you want to see Fast X with me this weekend? And I was like, I'm a few movies behind, but I'll catch up and uh, to watch it with you. And so in the past week, I watched Fast 8, Hobbs and Shaw, and Fast 9. And then Fast I was X. about to ask if you need to watch Hobbs and Shaw to keep up with the Fast lore. Um, Lore. slightly. It doesn't hurt. Slightly. And I think oh Hobbs God. and Shaw is fun and ridiculous. Um, if you enjoy the fast movies, I don't know why you wouldn't watch it. everyone welcome to casual obsession the horror movie podcast where we talk about horror movies today we are talking about annihilation a movie that came out while i was in college it says 2018 that feels fake <laughs> time is a lie <laughs> yeah. but yeah 2018 is when this movie came out uh it's yeah. a sci-fi horror um, and to give you just kind of an idea of what the movie's about, it's just about uh, some scientists going into a weird oil slick bubble around a state park, and no one really knows what's in there because people have gone in, but people have not come out again except for one dude who came out wrong. So now they're going in to try and figure out why. I mean, and that's the movie. I'm sure it's he fine came out as straight, and they were like, "That's not how this works." <laughs> It's a rainbow bubble, dude. Get it. Yeah. Come, on. <laughs> Come on. Get with the times. It's 2018. Oh it's 2018. <laughs> <laughs> but who's here oh with you God. today, Nina? Who is here with me? Um, it's, uh, I assume, Noah. I assume. I assume Noah's here. Are, are you Noah? No. I think is she's this talking Noah to you in the room with us right now. He's in the room with me right now. I'm going to stomp on your foot and say, "And with me is Noah." <laughs> and you will go. Yes. Um, and also Jeff and Emma are here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emma. Wow, they get a twofer, but well, I get because put you on the took spotlight. up all of their time. <laughs> yeah, all you had to do was say hi, bitch. <laughs> Damn. Um, but yeah, welcome. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm good. <laughs> Watch this crazy sorry, movie really, this week. I'm really excited <laughs> about this movie, and so I'm like trying to be so chill right now. Oh my god. Okay, I'll fast forward through into the uh, into the critical reception then. Uh, not good. Not good, huh? Yeah. People thought this movie was weird as hell. I wonder why they thought that. that. Not not necessarily in a good way because we got a six point eight on IMDb and eighty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. That's good. Pretty good. Hey. A 79 on Metacritic, pretty These good. These are good ratings. A 3.7 on. on Letterboxd, pretty good. Yeah, yeah 6.8's a little low. I mean, sure, but not as low as it's, you made it sound like it was going to be. It's 11 points lower than Metacritic. It's 20 points lower than Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, but like you and said, the, not good. I'm expecting like low too. numbers, bad reviews, and then you're like, mostly positive numbers. and it's It's a middling. I think this movie is perfect, so apart from one thing. Oscar Isaac Southern accent. Right, right. Whoa, yeah. no spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> um, but apart from important. that. Um, now, we have a, a wonderful return from favored enemy of the podcast, Twitter Brandon. He's my ally today. We're, we've called a truce because um, Twitter Brandon has talked about this movie at length because he really likes Alex Garland. He hasn't talked about Alex Garland um, I didn't look into what his thoughts are post men. Um, I'm guessing he disagrees with me because uh, you haven't he seen it. Does. You don't have a full opinion on it, right? Anyway, the point is, I'm not even interested in in men. I talked to Noah about this before the podcast. The story, as I understand it, um, and even the premise when I first saw the trailers, just doesn't really interest me, honestly. Oh, no, he hated Plus, men. oh good, you, excellent. Good, Twitter, good. Brandon. Um, Twitter you Brandon also, on my side. I, you heard my 
vitriolic hatred of men. We did hear. Um, I also did hear I that. Saw it. So I feel like yeah. you trust my opinion sometimes. I, I do. Um, I do, especially because you also like annihilation, right? And I do. I, I like so annihilation. I, I love ex machina. Yeah. So and I then figured there was that men. <laughs> and then there was men because I remember that's why you like saw is because it's Alex Garland. Right. And yeah. We were both optimistic. Yeah. Um. That was the reason I was going to see it, because though the plot doesn't interest me, I like both of Alex Garland's other movies. But um, Twitter Brandon, uh, Annihilation has consistently made top movie lists for him. Hey. Um, he it, it, it was number 16 of his top 50 films of 2018. Oh. And when asked his favorite movies for subgenres of horror, it was his favorite sci-fi horror. Nice. Um, also, the shot of the plants shaped like people Yo. was, I believe, uh, number 18 or something like that in his top 20 shots of the year. Nice. Okay. So, yeah. um, his and that was back movies. when he watched every movie that came out, uh, an era he does not look fondly back that on sounds so exhausting. you know he saw a lot of movies yeah i was about wow. to say yes. his top 50 movies from 2018 i don't think i saw five movies I was like, that year yeah i was gonna say i didn't even know 50 that movies was, came out in 2018 yeah that was that was a period <laughs> of my life that was um that, that was the end of my christian rock era i was yeah. not watching movies around that time can i give you all some hard a hard truth that yeah, i'm not go. entirely sure you're ready for but i feel like it needs to be said uh-oh Twitter Brandon is regularly called an enemy of the podcast, but whenever we find his reviews, they tend to align with what Here's we the think thing, of right? the movie. Uh... And Twitter Brandon is the enemy of the podcast because I think Brandon is a cool enough guy and Nina I don't hates like him. him. <laughs> he has a lot of uh, opinions that I disagree with. Yeah, I think he's um, only managing on a lot of things. 50-50 with us, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. There there have been movies in the past that like Noah's agreed with him on that I've disagreed with. Um, I think there are some movies. We watched one movie, Cocaine Bear, that I was sure he was going to fucking love. Yeah, he because hated that's Cocaine the type Bear, of movie didn't he? he? And he hated Cocaine yeah, Bear. Yeah, because he's stupid. Yeah. He doesn't know yeah, a good no, movie I have, when he watches there, it. There are a lot of things that like every time... Today is one of the highs. Every time that I'm like, I actually think this guy has good opinions. I think we align on things. Yeah. I And the things that we don't align on, I think I can now predict. So I think that as long as I understand him, I think it's going to be fine. And then something like Cocaine Bear will happen. And I'm like, I don't get this man. <laughs> I'm yeah. a big fan of Twitter, Brandon. He's in he's my, my life for better or for worse. Relationship. For better or for worse, he's there. I like he him lives as a less than three hours presence. away from me. Oh. And that's like a weird thing to that know. That is weird. Mm -hmm. He also, day, this is really funny. It, one day he's going to listen to the podcast. literally such a non-zero chance that I could actually okay. run into him. <laughs> so here's a fun fact about Twitter Brandon that I think is really funny. He's really into Dolph Lundgren. He like thinks Dolph Lundgren is like super hot. Um, yeah, okay. He is. <laughs> Fine, whatever. <laughs> And I follow another person who's big in the animation industry who I also have a 50-50 relationship uh, with where sometimes she just says stuff I really don't agree with. But she also drew super thick Cthulhu. Ooh. So I really cannot have too much of an issue with her. But both of them were horny tweeting about Dolph Lundgren at the same time one day. And okay. I think about that a lot. Kelly was horny tweeting. Brandon was sad tweeting because Dolph has cancer. Oh, oh yeah. Sucks. It was a back-to-back -back tweet, though. I'm of both so of them. sorry. I forget because Brandon Horny tweets about Dolph quite a bit. Yeah, sure. You'll forgive me for making a mistake. Um, but yeah, anyway, the Twitter Brandon liked this movie. Me too. Um, uh, what else? Noah scrolled down from the schedule, and I'm an idiot. Oh, uh, this is where we all give our reviews. Oh, okay. Yeah, what did we think? Uh, what, did, what did we what think did of the movie? What did we think of this movie? Okay, yeah. I'm gonna what I'm gonna we... do a three, two, one, and we all say our rating. No, at the don't same do that. That's time. too. That's way too what if, much pressure. What if we each pick somebody else and we try to guess what their rating is? Oh, I well, love nobody that. gets I love to that. guess okay. Nina's rating because we all know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nina doesn't get to guess mine. Nina. <laughs> I'll take no, Noah. I don't get... I'll take okay. Noah. I'll take Noah. Jeff. All right, so that means Noah. Um... I think I'll just sit it out. You guys go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Noah, I think you like this movie a lot. You already said you agree with Twitter Brandon on this. Um, I think you're going to give it a 9 out of 10. Oh, that's so good. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, for um, 
big fans of 10 star Noah out there. This was an eight star movie for me oh. when I first saw it. And on rewatching, I don't know what I didn't get about it because everything made so much more sense. I think yeah. watching it in a group call on discord as my first experience, probably not the greatest, I, but mm, God, what sense. a good movie on a rewatch. Actually, I think this is just a rewatcher. I think this mm -hmm. is a miss some things the first time around catch everything the second time movie. And then more the third, and then more the fourth, right, and then yeah, more the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I got a lot of notes about uh, how much I enjoyed a rewatch, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, knowing where it's going makes paying attention to it so much more gratifying. Yeah, the first All time right, it has to just turn. happen to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, this is the most information I've got about Jeff's thoughts about the movie the entire time. I've been leaking my information this whole time. Jeff's been playing it pretty close to the chest. Well, that and you know that for the fun facts of this movie, I had to do some reading about genetic research in 2011, which doesn't tell you mm -hmm. anything about whether I liked the movie, but it does tell you that I was looking for information and I had to really look. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give Jeff I'm gonna give Jeff my 2019 review of eight out of ten fucking wrong. Oh, get his ass! <laughs> I'm giving it a 10. <laughs> that Let fucking hell, that was my next guess. I was like, surely we don't low have two ball 10 me, stars how here. dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, low ball you. Uh, uh. <laughs> so All right, so now I have to guess Emma. Now, I do know from previous comments that you think favorably on this movie, but the question is how favorably? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My money's going on nine? I'm an eight. An eight? Oh. I'm an eight girly. Okay. Fuck. Emma's the much, only one that guessed right. Yeah, wow. I very much enjoyed this movie, and I like it a lot, and I think fondly of it. And there's a lot of really cool stuff about it, but I think my first viewing was ruined a bit, and I'll go into it why later, and that has affected my subsequent viewings. Mm. Fair enough. And Nina, were you ten? I'm so I I would be on a hundred if I could. This is my favorite movie. In yeah, the my whole my guess world. for you was that you were giving it like a twelve out of ten or some shit like that. Cause... Yeah, I got home last night. It's like ten forty five, eleven p.m. and Nina's like, "Oh, I'm so tired. We're gonna go to bed right away." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." I lay down, and then suddenly it's bzzz, all annihilation all the time for the next like thirty minutes. <laughs> That's incredible. It's my favorite movie. <laughs> That's awesome. Hell yeah. But yeah, no. Um, I also think it gets better on a rewatch. I think that my... who This is one of those things for me. First of all, I really like how straightforward it is while still having a lot of interpretations. All the characters pretty much outright state their own philosophies to the camera. And I really appreciate that in a movie that is so full of like... Um, using the environment as a sounding board mm. for those philosophies. Oh, um, I'm really glad that they just say them out loud so there's no room for error. Um, and then personally, this is um, when I was younger and I read Les Mis, I would reread it often and find a new character to relate to every time. And this movie is a lot like that, where every time that I've seen it subsequently, I, as I change as a person, my interpretation of the movie and its um, message changes as well. So mm. I will talk about that a little later because okay. it's changed a lot. Cool. But yeah, content warnings for this movie. There are some. It yes. is weird, as we mentioned before. Um, body horror is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, and right under body horror is cancer, because in this specific movie, the two are kind of uh, entwined in a lot of ways. Okay. We have self-harm mention. Um, some scars are shown on screen, just so you know. Um, we have a child death mention, and we have an on-screen suicide. So just be aware of those things. Yeah. Emma, you like this movie just fine. Are you scared of it at all? Ooh, so this ties into how uh -oh. the movie was a bit spoiled for me. Uh, oh, okay. So I can't talk about this too deeply in the non-spoilery section, but I'll take myself out of this one a bit. I don't personally find the movie very scary, but I have heard discussions of people being highly freaked out by it especially of certain parts right super um, yep. and there's definitely some like holy shit body horror moments 
So I'm just going to I'm going to give it a four. OK. Yeah. Um, This was the first horror movie I saw in theaters that was like actually the kind of horror movie I would like mm. Um, because I saw The Visit freshman year and I saw Split somewhere in there as well oh yeah um but this is the yeah this is the first time i saw a movie that like i was like oh this is like something i really am enjoying Mm -hmm. um and this is i think the movie where i realized that i was not scared of the kind of horror that i like um because i was so thrilled by the special effects and the concepts and everything none of it was scaring me not even the stuff that people cite as like being the thing that's scary Mm -hmm. i have studied a specific design in detail because I just think it's one of my favorite designs in anything ever. I wonder which so, one it might be. What could you be talking about? <laughs> what could I be talking about? Um, but yeah. Could be anything. Could be literally anything. All right. It's Oscar with that Isaac's out of the way. Southern accent. <laughs> oh my God. You're so right. Yeah, I've, I've looked at that man's vocal cords to figure out how the hell he was able to sound like that. <laughs> Honestly, now I'm more scared because you looked in his vocal cords. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would X-ray look in visions. Oscar Isaac's vocal cords any day. Hey, yo. I wouldn't, <laughs> for the record. Um, <laughs> to quote someone who I believe to be a great man, but change, change the quote up slightly, Oscar Isaac, he could turn my insights into outsides. I thought you were going to say Oscar Isaac, I hardly know him. <laughs> <laughs> The, the original quote is also applicable to this movie. It's Natalie Portman. She could turn my insides into outsides. Mm. Yeah, yes, I can back that. That is yeah. absolutely applicable yeah. to this movie. <laughs> um, okay, but that I'll get into Who it. are you quoting? Jackson. Jackson. Oh. Oh, Who else? Right. Jackson used... So obviously I haven't listened to Off the Air, Noah's other podcast right. in a very long time. But at least in the early days, he used to talk about his love of Natalie Portman yeah, not I did infrequently. That. Yeah, and he would say she could turn my insides into outsides. I think that's what's missing from God. modern off the air the most. Actually, Jackson doesn't talk about Natalie Portman enough. Yeah, that's true. true. Man, tell him Damn. to get on that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll run it up the chain. Okay, cool, nice, cool. good. You know what else I'm gonna run up the chain? What's that? The spoiler. Uh, the spoiler okay, summary for you, this Noah. movie. Yeah, hit thank us with you that. Segue. <laughs> okay, so this movie opens with um some beautiful folk music which is one of my favorite things is the is the soundtrack for this movie and a a unidentified object hurtling towards earth to just just this soft guitar like backing and um we get a shot of a beach as this thing hits a little lighthouse like through just like dead center i love that shot too i love how fast it is Mm -hmm. when it comes in Mm -hmm. it's so abrupt yeah um And immediately after hitting, a kind of oil slick shimmer starts to overtake this lighthouse. And this is our uh, inciting incident little guy. Um, We then see our main character, Lena, um, giving a lecture at a university. She's talking about how cells um, divide, how everything came from a single cell and has just kind of been changing dividing evolving and mutating ever since then um after this lecture she's chatting with a student when a fellow uh school staff member comes up to her and invites her out and she says no she's gonna go home and paint the bedroom uh she says our bedroom and then stops herself and her colleague is like dude your your husband's like totally super dead get over it um (laughs) And so, but she's like, no, I want to go home and paint this bedroom. So she goes home. She she gets to work, um, listening to music, kind of just into it. And in the doorway appears her husband, Kane, um, really, really disoriented. Uh, she immediately freaks out and hugs him. But he does not really react the way that you would expect someone to. Um, Over a glass of water, she tries to get some information out of him, figure out where he's been. He is very cagey about it, but we really quickly learned that that's not because he doesn't want to tell her. It's because he doesn't remember anything before seeing her. It seems like he just kind of wandered into the house and up the stairs. And when she asks, how did you get here? He basically says, I came through the door and there you were. 
when he takes a sip of the water, kind of stressed out by everything that's going on and not remembering and not having anything to tell her, he pulls the cup away and he's like, I'm not feeling so good. There's blood in the cup. Immediately he gets rushed uh, off in an ambulance. He appears to be seizing. He is not doing well. And as the ambulance is speeding along, they get um, accompanied abruptly by a bunch of military vehicles and um, stopped. And they take Kane and sedate Lena. Uh, Lena wakes up at a military facility and learns that Kane was part of a group of military personnel who had been sent into this weird oil slick bubble that has been dubbed the Shimmer. Um, they've been it's been um, growing out of the state park for a while now. And they've been sending in personnel and equipment and have got nothing back before Kane came out. Um, they didn't know that he had come out either. The first they heard of it was this whole um, emergency ordeal. Uh, he seems to be having multiple organ fail failure. Um, and Lena is immediately concerned. She talks to Dr. Ventress, a psychologist who had done all of the um, screening for people who had gone into the Shimmer. And learns very little because there's very little to learn. While she's hanging out trying to figure out what's going on, she meets some other scientists, all women, who tell her their um, different backgrounds in science. They learn that she's a biologist and pretty much assume that she's there for the same reason that they are, to go into the shimmer. Lena's like, that's actually a great idea. I would love to figure out what's going on myself. Because of this, she doesn't tell them that Kane is her husband, afraid that it would complicate things. So uh, the women, Ventress, Lena, um, we have Gina Rodriguez playing a character whose name I never remember. Uh, does anyone else remember Gina Rodriguez's character's uh, name? I don't think I know who Gina Rodriguez is, but I have all their names written down somewhere. Um, uh, I, she's not Josie or Cassie. Josie and Cassie, I remember. She's the flirtatious lesbian. Anya. Anya, thank you. So we have um, Anya, we have Josie, who's played by Tessa Thompson, and we have Cassie, who is blonde, and that's really what I remember about her. Um, <laughs> they go, all go into the Shimmer, and they pass the tree line and this barrier, and they immediately wake up in tents several days later, having lost all memory of how they got where they are. Their equipment isn't working, they've... They know a few days have gone by because the rations are gone. It seems like they were operating logically. They set up camp and everything, but none of them remember doing it. Um, they figure out their bearings based on the sun and decide that they're going to head to the coast because they know that the epicenter is in this lighthouse. So they're like, we'll go to the co coast and then we'll head to the lighthouse. We'll call that that. Um, as they keep heading forward... They see um, kind of this, it's in this swamp area. They find this boathouse and the boathouse is being overrun by these plants. Lena immediately takes interest in this because they're all different species, but they are growing from the same vine. As they are exploring the boathouse, uh, I believe it's Josie gets pulled under um, in, in this like house by her backpack. They get her out and they're all freaking out like what did that and this giant crocodile lunges out of the swamp they're um, able to take it down alligator actually <laughs> oh i'm so sorry they're in he's the an american alligator. south they're not in egypt <laughs> he's a big boy he is, a big is boy. what's important he's a very big he's boy. a very he's a very he's actually big a croc boy. shark thank you oh the he, shark -a he's a lot of things the shark -a the, the shark shader the shader his, um, name's, his name was James Shader. <laughs> I'm the fucking lizard king. <laughs> Good job, everyone. We Excellent did it. We got it. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> um, yeah, so they kill this thing, and Lena, as she's shooting it, takes notice of something um, and has Anya hold its mouth open so she can look at these, like, rows of teeth that this thing has grown um another weird mutation as they continue in they find what was the old camp for this um military kind of um investigation um because the shimmer has been growing outward at a very rapid pace and it overtook that base and now they've had to move out 
Um, they decide since they're familiar with the area, or at least a lot of them who had stayed in that old base are familiar with the area, they're going to stay here for the night in the mess hall. When they get to the mess hall, they notice um, a list of different names. It looks like the group that Kane was in had been here and set up watch. They take this as a um, cue that they should also be doing watch. Uh, and then they find on a table a little baggie with um, some SD cards, I think. Yep. Um, they watch the footage back and see some real fucked up shit. Um, yeah. Kane has a fellow member of his team with him and with consent cuts the man's stomach open to show that his intestines are moving on their own. Um, like eels, one might say. Like eels. Not not in the way that, like, we all kind of are aware that our intestines just be moving. That's kind of a normal thing that they're supposed to do. That's not how these are moving. These are moving in a very weird way. Yeah. Um, th this footage, understandably, freaks Anya the fuck out. Um, she was a paramedic, uh, and she's like, look, I know how bodies look and work, and I've seen some really gruesome shit. That's weird. That's not normal. That must be a trick of the light. We're all hallucinating. And everyone's like, Anya, I don't think that's true. Do you want to watch the footage back so you can see? And she's like, absolutely <laughs> the fuck not, and storms off. I kind of love that um, from her, honestly. She's just like, no, I'm not watching it again. You do it. And just <laughs> leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously Lena's freaked the fuck out too because that was her husband who just cut some dude open. Yeah. They move further into the mess hall and find this pool area where this kind of live viv like vivisection took place. And they find the man's body has kind of bloomed outwards into this giant like mold like spread over mm. the pool wall. His torso has been like disconnected oh, from yeah, his it's legs. Like separated, it's separated, it's spread out. His body is just kind of like, you know, if you've ever seen like um, mold or grow in like a Petri dish, yeah. uh, like cell organisms grow in a Petri dish, you know how they kind of separate out and bloom and stuff. And it looks like that's how this happened. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. so, and that's, so and cool. And this is the kind of thing that's like happening everywhere in this movie, all over walls and trees mm -hmm. and shit. You see it in the background always. There's these like plants that are producing like multiple different kinds of flowers all at once and stuff. But this time there's just pieces of a dude spread out in it. And I, yeah. I don't know about it the rest of you but i love seeing a dude just become part of a wall sometimes i think that's it's cool. kind of neat i think that's a cool it's thing a to look. do and this i think might be my favorite wall guy this is the wall this guy is a for real me. good wall yeah. guy. it's a really good wall guy um we have another kind of almost wall guy in this movie as well but this one is far superior mm -hmm. um so yeah uh everyone's freaked out nobody wants to stay here but they gotta because it is kind of the safest place uh, they decide to take watch in shifts, and um, as they're taking watch, I did I did skip over a bit while they were kind of paddling to this area. Uh, Cassie and Lena had had a conversation about why everyone's here and how everyone has issues, and Cassie said that she lost her daughter um, and that she knows Josie has had a history of self-harming and that Anya used to be an addict and that no one knows what Ventress's deal is. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then this night while they're while they're setting up this watch, uh, Lena is up late studying some uh, cells that she has collected and she's noticing some weird shit. And Cassie's like, hey, are you all right? And Lena's like, not really. I'm going to go swap out with Ventress. Um, she goes out to swap shifts with Ventress. The two kind of recollect their thoughts over the map, discuss um, whether it was wise to keep her relationship with Kane a secret. And then they talk about self-destructing and how um, Kane coming in might have been a um, attempt at sabotage and how Ventress kind of believes that humans are kind of just prone to, to self-destruction. And this is just something that everyone does. As they're having this conversation, something breaks in through the fence and everyone kind of gathers up to see what the fuck it is. It's a fucking bear. And it just nabs Cassie right out of the lineup and runs off into the woods with her. Again, everyone is freaked the fuck out. Anya especially is really worked up about it, but they continue on the next day anyway with nothing else to really do. They do come across pieces of Cassie. Um, they come across, <laughs> as they're in the woods, they come across a piece of her, her foot and Anya still kind of in denial about this is like, well, maybe she's still alive. And Lena's like, well, I'll go look then. 
and starts into the woods on her own, both to kind of look for Cassie and to kind of take a minute to herself. Uh, she sees these two deer, one of which is um, got nothing going on apart from looking a little weird, and another that is has like blossoms growing out of its horns. It's a really serene moment in the middle of this horror, and then do the they... two of the deer run off. No, the, the deer are dead identical. Yeah, do they? Yeah, no, do they're... they not both have the blossoms on their horns? And no, stuff? one of them doesn't. This is very important to me. <laughs> They, I promise. I am absolutely certain both times that I've watched this movie over the last two days that both of those deer had blossoms on their horns, but one Play had like the patches tape on its fur. Back. I'm pulling it up right now. <laughs> Please do, because I yeah, I'm have... Looking them up. I thought it had blossoms on both. Oh, one is blossoms and one is twigs. They oh, are identical oh. antlers, but one is in bloom and one looks like shit. I'm telling you, this is important to philosophical things about this movie later, so... I'm uh, I'm sending a picture in chat. Um, but yeah, so she sees these deer, uh, and then she continues on and does find Cassie's body. Uh, she comes back alone, recounts that she found Cassie's body. Everyone is again very worked up. Um, they continue on. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's a creepy fucking deer. Some creepy fucking deer. They are really creepy. The way they move is very... Because they move completely in sync. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I love the one with the blossoms. Slay, girl boss, big fan. The other <laughs> one is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they continue on again. Uh, and they find... Um, they have a little argument after Cassie is dead. Anya and Josie would love to leave. Ventress is like, no, we're continuing on. Yes, Cassie is dead, but there's really, like, we got to keep going. Uh, Anya gets pissed at Lena for not backing her up. But Lena's like, yo, dude, like, we don't know how we got to where we are. We we lost several days. We think, uh, like, six days. So, honestly, it's probably better to continue on towards the coast anyway, and then we'll split there, and some of us can head towards the perimeter wall, and the others can head inward, whatever we end up doing when we get there. Um, as they continue towards the coast, they find a house and some plants that look like people. Um, the plants that look like people, Josie and Lena have a conversation. They think that these plants are mimicking like human genes, which is really weird. She thinks that the shimmer is refracting not just like actual light at the barrier, but also everything, DNA and radio signals and everything, which leads um, to some more stress uh, in the group as Ventress deduces that Josie means when she says DNA, not just the plant DNA, but also the DNA of the people in here. They decide to spend the night in this house, which is a replica of Lena's house. Um, this is something that, like, I don't think I noticed on my first watch through. Um, but it is a direct uh, replica of Lena's house. Um, they decide they're going to sleep there. Lena has a dream about how she was cheating on her husband while he was gone with that uh, professor from the beginning. And she gets woken up by Anya calling her a liar. Anya ties the other three to chairs and reveals that she found out that uh, Lena and Kane are related somehow. After some brief questioning, she figures out that Kane is Lena's husband and starts to break down, wondering if um, Lena killed Kate, Cassie, if... Um, if Anya's going insane, if they're all going insane, she has no clue what's going on. She admits that her fingerprints are moving when she looks at them. She feels like she is coming apart at the seams and she wonders if her body has changed to the point that we saw the bands in that videotape. Um, as she's having this little monologue, we hear Cassie's voice outside and Anya runs to see what's going on. It's not Cassie, it's the bear. Uh, Anya's face has her skull has like fused into this bear it's like mutated into her it's mimicking her voice um and her cries for help and um super it, it super duper creepy one of my favorite creature designs ever because it's so simple and yet so fucking scary yeah. um the voice is perfect too it's so good um Obviously, there are still three women tied to chairs. They stay still as this thing kind of moves around them and starts to gnaw on Josie for a second before Anya 
Oh, sorry. Before Anya reappears and starts unloading into it, there's a brief scuffle. Um, Anya dies quite brutally, but they do manage, Josie manages to shoot this bear down. Um, she just unloads into it uh, and it falls over. The next day, still not doing super well, um, Ventress is like, this is taking too long. I'm pissed. I am going. You, I will see you at the lighthouse or not. Farewell. Um, Josie and Lena linger for a second and Lena confides in, or Josie confides in Lena that she is really saddened by the fact that the one thing to kind of persist of Cassie after she died was her final moments of like fear and despair and desperation. And she's like, I don't want to go that way, man. And she reveals that um, out of her self-harm scars are growing some flowers kind of interestingly. Um, I'm not sure... This is one thing I don't remember. It doesn't, I'm not sure she put them in there herself or if they um, are growing just because of like mutation stuff. I don't think it's um, shown that she put them in there intentionally. Mm -hmm. It kind of seems yeah, like I don't she think it... notices it happening and just kind of embraces it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she does embrace it. She walks off and um, by the time that Lena gets around a corner to see if she can find her, there are only human shaped plants um, and it's, ambiguous as to whether or not one of them is Josie. Lena continues to head towards the coast and eventually does come across the lighthouse. Um, the lighthouse is on this beach that has a bunch of crystal trees growing on it. It's gorgeous. When she gets inside of the lighthouse, it's pure white on the inside other than um, the blue door. And there is a hole where the um, entity came through. There's some like white lichen growing on the wall and there's a bunch of bunch of ash because there's a burned up body sitting on the ground and a camera pointed at it. Um, she watches the tape back and sees that the body is Kane's because uh, Kane, Kane sets himself up with this grenade talking to whoever's operating the camera. He he says something along the lines of like, I don't know who I am anymore. Am I me? Are you me? when you get out of here, go find Lena. And then he sets off a phosphorus grenade before, after telling the person filming him that it's going to be bright because he's seen one before and the person behind the camera hasn't. The person behind the camera comes around the front. It's Kane. Surprise. <laughs> um, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Lena's obviously freaked out by this. There is a hole in the floor of the lighthouse as well. The, the kind of object went further into the ground. She climbs down into this hole and finds Ventress having a similar breakdown to Anya's. She um, kind of has this existential crisis that ends in her expressing that whatever is down here is inside of her now, and she is decaying and falling apart rapidly, which could be read as the cancer that we know she has, and also could be read as the fucking alien, which uh, disintegrates her. The alien creates, and this is where um, I've seen this scene more times than I've seen this movie because <laughs> I put everything down and I rewind it and I've seen this a million times. As she disintegrates, this kind of fractal forms. It's, con it's continuously flowing outwards from inside, the pattern always changing but never ending. And Lena is mesmerized by this. She stands in front of it just kind of looking at it until a bead of blood comes off of her nose and flies into the center of this thing. Her cells start to divide, and the next thing that she knows, she wakes up in the lighthouse again. Yeah, Jeff, what's Can up? Can I get into a detail about this cell division scene real quickly? Oh, for sure. So all previous cell divisions that we've seen, right? Because there's a number of cell division shots in this because she's always looking at stuff under her microscope. Yeah. We we get this right from the beginning of the movie when she is giving that lecture with the, the video of the, uh, the cancer cells splitting and stuff. Everything that she checks within the shimmer uh, it starts with like a regular looking cell and then as she watches it like it splits and of the the resulting pair of cells one is always like kind of regular looking and the other is all like rainbow colored and all fucked up looking but then with this one when we see her blood split with the creature the the resulting pair of cells are both rainbowed and fucked up looking Ooh. this is the only time that that happens Excellent. with a cell splitting shot in this one super fun love that um yeah so then yeah, yeah so then she, the, the the creature like yeah. forms itself and she shoots it and runs away yep pretty much 
uh, there, there's a lot of shit that that's basically what happens. She manages to slip a phosphorus grenade into this thing's hand as it mir- mirrors her. She sets it off. As it's dying, um, she's running away. Uh, it reaches out towards Kane, which I found really interesting. Kane's body, the first thing that it goes to as it's on fire is him. And then everything burns the fuck down. Uh, Lena manages to uh, make it back. She's been having this kind of interview as a framing device with the people at the um, facility. And they're like, so you literally have no fucking clue what, what that thing was. And she's like, nope. And they're like, okay cool you want to see your husband he's stabilized after the shimmer disappeared that's not weird at all and she's like yes i would love to the two see each other again and she um brings out the fact that she's pretty sure he's not kane and he's like yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty sure i'm not either are you lena um she doesn't give him an answer either way and they hug and we see the shimmer reflected in both of their irises um and that's the end of the movie (laughs) Yeah. Um, I love this movie very, it's very much. I think it's amazing. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Emma, I want to hear why your first viewing was ruined. Yeah, I so also would. I great question. Thank you for asking. I didn't <laughs> plan to watch this movie because <laughs> um back then I hated women. No, of that's course, a joke. Right, right. <laughs> uh, I was still I was still firmly in the belief that I was um too scared of horror movies and um, I wouldn't be able to handle them, but scary stuff fascinated me growing up. I always loved hearing and reading stories, um, about like creepy things. And so even if I didn't want to watch or play a game that I thought was scary, if I was interested enough, a lot of times I would like read about what happens in it. I used to um, do this too, all the time. Yep. I didn't do that with this, but I I started seeing on Reddit a lot people talking about Annihilation and specifically the bear scene as being like so creepy, but like interesting and like, oh my God, it was horrifying. And so, and like the bear scene is really cool, but it was built up so much. And then I was also really nervous to like look it up or look into it because I thought it would be scary. And so eventually I decided I'm just going to look it up. So I found like a clip of it on YouTube that was like really low quality and I watched it and I was like, I didn't realize how desensitized to horror I was at the point, Mm. but I watched it and it was low quality and I was like, maybe like, I just don't find it scary because it's so low quality and maybe like in the context of the movie and everything else, it'll be like a lot more creepy for me. Um, I do think it does need the context of the movie to actually hit in the proper way. But then... I was expecting a lot more once I got to that point in the movie and it was still like very dark and kind of like hard to see exactly what like all the details of the bear and like various other things. And so I still didn't find myself scared and I was like, everybody else was like so freaked out by this and I don't get it. (laughs) Um, And so that kind of like deflated me a bit. Um, and so I think that's sense, yeah. affected me ever since on my rewatches of the movie. I think it's an incredible movie, but as far as like personal enjoyment goes, I just think yeah. I sit around an eight. That's okay. so, so valid. I don't know how I would have reacted to this movie or if I'd be as attached to it as I am if it hadn't been one of those like random experiences of let's go watch a movie and mm. then it ends up like being really good because i think like the unexpected gems are the ones that stick with you the longest um just knowing yeah. nothing about it going in was definitely part of why um it stuck so hard for me so i totally 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 i that. could see that yeah mm-hmm. totally also this isn't related to this movie but it's alex garland fact ah. that I didn't know until I was looking into this movie more after watching mm-hmm. it recently. But um, I didn't know that he ghost directed the Dread movie in like the early 20 teens. Oh, yeah. No apparently shit. he was that recently. That makes so much sense. Yeah, apparently he was like recently off of making Dread when he made Ex Machina, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think Dread it's goes like his hard. Dread does go hard. First I watched it pretty major, recently. like semi credit. But yeah, I. Me and my friend Matt saw that movie in theaters. We loved it. it. Rocks. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then I have since loved Ex Machina and Annihilation and Not Men. Sure. But, <laughs> um, so true. So true. But it, I w- it was surprising when I learned that recently. Yeah. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, I actually just learned I've, that earlier today. I've heard a lot of people talk about 
Bo is afraid the same way that they talked about men, which oh. is, wow, I really liked Ari Aster's first two movies. I hope this next yeah. one's good. <laughs> That's why initially I was like, oh, I'm going to go see Bo is afraid. And then seeing people's reactions all week, I'm like, this is giving me men vibes. I think mm-hmm. I should avoid it. Uh. Yeah. I think the most, uh, this is um, something that it's a fucking little um, bonus for you guys. Something that I heard one reviewer that I really trust say um, was that he's seen all of Ari Aster's like short films mm. and it feels like he used this as an opportunity to use a big budget for those same concepts and some of it felt like they were better executed as short films. Ooh. Oof. And that they didn't really tie together as a full narrative. Nice. So yeah, okay. that was that was the review that I heard that was the most mid. Everyone else has been like really negative. Sure. So I still um, except for one person who really it. liked it. Yeah, I I like divisive movies. So like I'm I'm excited to watch it and find out what I think of it. But I didn't want to. Yeah, so Jeff, you should watch Men. I I I still don't know anything at all about Men. I haven't seen a trailer. I right. haven't heard that's, anyone say that's the anything best way to detailed watch about it. it. I know nothing at all. <laughs> so, so perfect. S- something that I did know about Men was that it had some like relationship stuff, um, and it, it, that's like maybe if I had to pick one thing that I don't love about Annihilation, though I think it's necessary to the things that I do love, is the fucking cheating subplot. It seems it's unnecessary. Super- it is it super is. necessary to like be... I get you you talk Nina you know no. way more about this than I do probably I think it's necessary because I think it strengthens um the overall themes when it comes to especially Lena and Kane's relationship at the end of the movie and I'll talk about that later um this is based on my read this time around. In the past, it, it also strengthened the other read. So I, I've always thought like, well, you know, I don't think there is a different subplot they could have used that would have um, backed up the other things this movie is saying and made Lena work as well as she does. Because I think what Lena does being driven by this guilt and being driven by um, kind of a desire to reconnect with Kane, I think that's important. Mm-hmm. So... But I don't really like cheating as a subplot generally. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Side eyes, Mike Flanagan. Love you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, though. <laughs> I don't want to talk the whole time, so I'm just okay. I'm gonna sit back here. So do we want to? <laughs> I was expecting you to talk the whole yeah. time. <laughs> uh, I, I could, but I won't. Do you want to hear some stuff from Alex Garland about this movie? I would love and to. And actually, would he before I get to the stuff he had to say about this movie, I, I read this interview that he did where he was talking about this, and he ended up talking about a number of other things, including his like generalized creative process. Ooh, always love The that. way that he made Ex Machina was because he had just made Dread, and he says that every mm-hmm. time he goes into a project, he's always just like trying to get as far away from his previous project as he possibly can. Oh, I see. His so entire, Annihilation he, like, was about a bunch of ass awesome women, and then he made men. Exactly. <laughs> he literally, he just like tracked his entire movie making career from uh, writing 28 Days Later up until what was at that time the present with making Annihilation. And he was like, yeah, I did this because I was trying to get away from this. I did this because I was trying to get away from this. And I did this that's this so... way because I was trying to get away from this. And then he was like, yeah, in Ex Machina, that's a movie that has a ton of complex little moving parts. And it's very like message forward, very concept forward. It's a movie that you have to be like thinking and stuff to be watching it and like really getting it. So then going into Annihilation, it's far more of like an atmospheric aesthetic experience forward. You know, not that it doesn't have more like thinky stuff to but it, but- the thinky stuff is way more abstract. Right, you got to honestly. really be looking to find that stuff. The primary thing about Annihilation is the atmospheric aesthetic experience. He felt like that was the most important part of it, which is the reason that he didn't reread the book that it's based on. Oh, good. He had read it before. He apparently he read it while they were doing post production for Ex Machina because um, this one producer whose name was, I think, Scott Rudin, um, like had read it recently and was just like, hey, you should check this out. I think you'll enjoy it. And he read it and immediately became obsessed with it. And he was like, yo, this is awesome. And he ended up being able to get permission from Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote it, um, to do an adaptation that would be 
very loose because I guess the feel of the book, he said, was very like sort of dreamlike, kind of vague, maybe. And it's the kind of thing that would be very, very difficult to adapt straight into an actual movie. So he kind of like sat down, sat down with Jeff Vandermeer, the author, and had a conversation about that, the difficulty of adapting it. And more or less, they arrived at the concept of him just doing a looser adaptation. He describes it as an adaptation of his memory of the book, which kind of sounds like some oh. Stanley Kubrick The Shining stuff, right? But he mm -hmm. felt like I that was that, the best though. way to keep the focus on the dreamlike atmospheric feel of it. And it like, I isn't that, that fucking cool? That's really cool. And it makes me more, because I was talking to Noah about this. I would love to read this book. Sure. Um, it's a trilogy, but I have actually. Pre yeah, the mm -hmm. Southern Reach trilogy. Yeah. Um, I would love to read it, um, but I was afraid previous that it was going to affect my enjoyment of the movie. Doesn't have to. Um, but it doesn't they're have to, knowing connected. that like their their <laughs> vibes connected. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who love both, so oh, okay. um, I do want to read it. Yeah. But I think it's really interesting because beyond like the storytelling and aesthetics, there's also a lot of other parallels between Ex Machina and Annihilation oh. as far as being opposites. Yeah. Because you have technology versus biology, mm -hmm. you have um, kind of trying to predict human nature versus accepting that it's unpredictable, and you have the worst men ever and the coolest women ever <laughs> kind of <laughs> the you have just two kind of i to me ex machina is really a, a lot of it is a story of specifically for the two dudes men's desire to create and control women or to create a woman that can be controlled yeah. And both men do this in their own way. You have the one who's very open about it, and then you have the one who thinks that he's a good guy. Yeah. And then in this movie, you have a bunch of women who are like open to various degrees about their own personal struggles. And the main character has hurt someone, but her entire journey is very intentional in a way to reconcile that hurt. Um, yeah. So I think that that's an interesting kind of difference as well. And I don't think that she's doing it with any intention to manipulate. I think she sees what her her hurt has driven him to do. And she is doing the only thing she knows how to do to maybe fix that as a scientist. Mm -hmm. Everything she does is so scientifically driven. And I love her for Good that. Bit, yeah. Yeah. She stays very focused on that. Okay. One more quote from Alex Garland here. Because I, I wrote this one down specifically just because it's a very Nina core thing to say. I can send oh, you a good. link to this entire interview, actually. But um, Please do, because uh, I'm very interested. He had been saying something about how he felt that Annihilation was, you know, in contrast to Ex Machina. Ex Machina is like, you know, all one location, only a very limited number of characters, very focused kind of a thing, right? Whereas then Annihilation, it's this big open, it's all this swampland, you've got more characters, and the scope of the whole thing is just so much wider. Uh, so the interviewer was basically asking, going into Annihilation, were you thinking of how this one had to be bigger in scope than your previous projects? And Alex Garland said, uh, no, I don't think in those terms. You just write the thing that you're obsessed with, and then you figure out how to make it. That's something <laughs> very similar to what Sanderson, my other um, kind of kindred spirit about writing, has said as well, yep. which is that like... You've got to do it, just, so you just do it. You've got to do it. That, that's that's something he went on to say as he kept talking. <laughs> yeah, he's like, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, just write the thing you're obsessed with. Just do it, and then figure out how to make it. You come up with the idea, and you figure out how to do it. Then an enormous amount of how to do it becomes what the film is in a weird way. Right. And uh, in This is something... Oh, no, sorry, go uh, ahead. He, he also went on to talk about how in the book specifically, the thing that obsessed him was... Uh, combination of the atmosphere and the themes of self-destruction so so yeah. <laughs> one thing that really um one thing that really interests me with that is like this is something that has ironically come up in the conversation about ai which is mm. that a lot of these people who are really into ai want to skip the process of creation they want their idea to just be a thing yep. but i was talking about this recently is every time i've started uh, writing a book that i've finished so um well, I'll say three because I'm going to be generous. Sure. Um, I haven't had the middle figured out. I know the beginning. I kind of know the end. I at least know where I where I want things to end in a in a grander sense, but I don't exactly know the middle. And then you get into making it, and 
a throwaway line or a question comes up and that question becomes the focus of the middle. Uh, and all of a sudden, like that leads into the end because by the time that you get to like just exploring that question, it's like, okay, so then the answer to this question is the end. And I think that's kind of why I've abandoned the traditional three act structure by accident is because I'm not like thinking in those terms when I'm writing. Um, well, no, you're writing. Which I think you're writing this... prog books, so <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's it's which just... is <laughs> it's kind of how annihilation is as well. Is like a little bit. Yeah, it, there's not like there's not really that three act structure. No. things are happening, but each thing that happens, it, which okay, I'm gonna get into the themes now. Yeah. Um, everything that happens in this movie is influenced by the th things everything that has happened up until that point totally which to me when i first watched this and the second time i watched this um i was still in college and um i was not in a great place and college, i right. really um i watched and i watched analyzation videos for this and they were all talking about self-destruction and i took that to mean that the movie is about how inevitable self-destruction is in kind of the ventricy anya e sad way. Oh. But upon being older and being happier and watching it, this movie strikes me much more as I think something that gets said in the movie about um, it's not like it's changing things. It's changing everything. The the shimmer is. This is a movie about change. Yeah. How Ventress says it at one point, but she says it negatively oh, yes. because she is someone this is stuff that I flagged. Who that is, I was going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. She is such a negative person that she sees this as a negative. She says the person who gets out of this is not who ends this is not going to be the one who starts it, and I want to be the one who uh -huh. ends it. And it's like she sees that as a negative, but this whole movie is about how your old self has to be destroyed for you to change into something new. And that thing is not going to necessarily be perfect or beautiful or anything like that, but it is going to be different. And it's going to be influenced by every single person and everything that you saw them do along the way. Everything that happens shows someone else what they need to do. Um, okay. Lena could not have gotten out of there, first off, without Ventress completely failing. Ventress dying was necessary to lena being able to make it out that's important because we are, some of us most of us aren't able to make it out of life and and become better people without seeing someone else do something and deciding i am not going to be like that mm -hmm. and that is something that happens both with ventress and with kane kane so it's really interesting to me that lena and kane met in the military mm -hmm. because a lot of military personnel struggle with ptsd and this is something that I think is really clearly telegraphed with Kane specifically. He coming back a, a literal, complete different entity, no longer the Kane that went in. Now this this alien, alien to the world that he lives in. Now he has suffered severe PTSD in this metaphor. Right, clearly. Lena, in who has gone through things and and always because being being part of the military like we talked about with um bones and all like having this unique experience with the person that you spent your life with that they can also understand this important part of you that you can understand he comes back from this mission that she didn't go on and he is different again he has he has experienced something that she did not experience and that's weird for them um so she immediately is like the way to fix this is for me to experience the thing that he cannot tell me about oh. and he and no one can tell me about. I am going in to experience it for myself. And because of that, despite the fact that she's only in there to help him, he ends up helping her with that video. She would not have been able to make it out if he hadn't already not made it out. That video told her that if the thing manages to complete its transformation it seems like based on that video the only result is only one of them makes it out alive and kane decided that he wasn't it so she's like i'm not gonna let it get that far she would not have known that if he had not already been through that yeah and it's the same for a lot of other things in this movie is everyone watching josie watching how cassie and anya died and realizing i don't want to go out like that you know Everyone sees everyone else, the tapes of the last crew, and and all of that just leads, including 
seeing the alien and how it's reacting to its environment. All of that leads to this climax of the decisions that are made and the just relationship between Kane and Lena. I... Ah! Okay, so I saw a lot of that same stuff and with less of a focus on Lena and Kane's relationship, more of a focus on the team moving through the shimmer, I was thinking of a completely different set of things. It had me kind of thinking about social, like, societal change. Like, uh, Ventress's one line where she says, uh, you know, I want to be the one that ends this, you know, all that stuff, um, had me thinking about, like, just how, how fucking naive is it to think that you can go and have an experience without it changing you? How stupid is that as a thing to, to think that it's mm-hmm. possible, right? You can't go out and pers- you know, get, get through any manner of an undertaking without it altering you on some level. It's just not possible to do. You can't go into it and say, this cannot possibly change me and I'm going to go do it because in doing it, you change yourself. Meanwhile, we have uh, uh, we've we've got parts of the team really resisting the idea that they're going to be changed by this trip and others kind of embracing it. Uh, And then we get like Josie, who sees the disastrous results of resisting this thing and says, I don't like the sound of that. And she chooses to embrace the change, and then she is embraced by the change in turn. That and, like, all the military stuff kind of has me thinking that, like, as society changes around you, as your social situations change around you, you can react to those changes any way that you like, but if you react to the change violently, the change will react to you violently. If you embrace the change, the change also embraces you. So this is so interesting because something that comes up is that most of the people going into the shimmer really went in thinking that they were not going to come exactly. out. Lena is the only teams. one thinking that she she's thinking, well, even within this team, yeah. a lot of them are self-destructive yeah. and that like Ventress's point of view makes sense as someone who has cancer. Right, yeah. It hurt it would seem even more silly and naive coming from someone who wasn't already like in the position she's right. in. But Lena, looking at it as a ter- as like a metaphor for societal change, Lena is the only one who is like this is going to be something, whatever we do in here, I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. Everyone else is like, we're not living. We're done. This is it. Right. Yeah. So for her to be the one who's like the one who makes it out, the one who resists just the right amount, honestly, Mm -hmm. um, the one who is open to the change and is open to pushing forward, um, but not in a way that is, this is okay. This is so interesting to me about the alien is like neither Kane nor Lena are like hostile to the alien per se. Lena is hostile to it in that she is doing it for survival. Right. But when she comes back and she sees Kane and she knows Kane is the alien, she's not hostile towards no. him. Okay, well, okay, wait, wait, hold on though. Cause um back to the cell division thing real quickly. I know this is gonna seem right. unconnected, but no, okay, no, cell ahead. division, right, is not a cell making a copy of itself and then continuing to be itself. It is a cell destroying itself to become two separate things. The original Mm -hmm. cell ceases to exist full on. Mm -hmm. A copy of Kane was created, but was a copy made of him or was he split into two Kanes? Because the stuff that he's saying in the video, the stuff that he's saying in the video is all, I don't know who I am anymore and I don't know who I was before. Well, like, was I me before or were you me before? What he's... He's using weird phrases, but what he's asking is which of us is the original and which of us is the copy. But the answer is no to both because neither of them is an original. Neither of them is a copy per se. They were created as something new, like Lena says at the end of the movie. Right, which is why Kane isn't able to exist anymore at all until the Shimmer dies because both both of the things that came together to create this Kane had to stop existing for him to be able to exist on his own, both Kane the human and the entity that started the Shimmer. Um, Because it was like he was still attached to, he hadn't fully become this new thing yet because the Shimmer still existed. Mm -hmm. I think also, I think like, I mean, we don't know much about um, transmission once Kane was out of, the shimmer right but i feel like 
her being around Kane um, without protection or anything and like kissing and hugging and stuff somehow like primed her body potentially into like receiving the changes a bit better once she was inside the shimmer. And then while inside the shimmer, even though the metallic alien died or whatever, by the end of all that, she's a completely different person anyway because of all the changes that have happened. And she's still like of the shimmer, even though it's her original body. Well, but right? is it her original body? A copy got made it of is. her, and according to the theory that I just laid out... No, I think it is. I think the fact that... Sorry, this ah. is me being... I'm, like, dropping it. But I think it's I think it's important because... Um, because the... The copy never finished being made. Ah, uh, okay, so, but... But the cell division thing. All previous cell division shots in the movie, there was, like, a normal-looking cell and then one fucked-up cell with her blood split into two fucked-up cells. I kind of feel like yeah, that's an that's... indication to us that like both resultant copies are of the shimmer, more or less. You I don't mean, have she to subscribe is, to but my I don't theory. Think it's, it's what I think. Right. She, she I... is, but it's because she has mutated. Sorry, Noah. I'm going to talk because I haven't talked. You haven't episode. at all. Go <laughs> <laughs> off. No, I, but I feel like another like great theme uh, that uh, we have lightly touched on here is just how much things change you as you experience yeah. them. Mm. And um, the shimmer is a a visual, physical change that you can see. Mm. You know, she goes in without a tattoo. She leaves Yo, with what's her face's yeah. tattoo. But she gets that part way through. The I'm, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah, everything about the place changed who she was, but she is still who she is. I, I feel like it is important for yes. her to be her at the end, just changed by everything. Like, changed to a point where she might not really be like, this she's not the same anymore but she is definitely still her mm -hmm. yes despite the changes okay. i also think that that's important because i think that that um going back to kane like i think that it's important that because she had more information going in she was able to stay herself in a way that kane wasn't because she had more to learn from i think all the transformations also being like vibes based I don't know if there would be, uh, well, my personal read would be, I don't know if there would be any like real priming her for the situation because I also get the idea that she was outside the shimmer in that base for a hot minute, not like just a day or two. Mm -hmm. So my read uh, in, in general is just that because her entire life just kind of collapsed around her when he came home wrong, right. she's just like, well, let's just see what happens because if I don't get anything done, then he's not back anyway and nothing really... Nothing really matters at that point. Right. And she's not mm. the only one who changes in there. No one else makes it out, but the others do still talk about ways that they are changing as well. We just don't like with with Anya talking about her fingerprints and such mm -hmm. and the ways that Josie changes as well. And as mm -hmm. we all know, Anya, come on, that's a trick of the light. Bodies oh my don't god, do poor that. Anya. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Honestly, if I started feeling intestines and stuff moving around inside of me and seeing all that i'd be done i'm like i think no. she's totally, no, totally i love how she's written yeah i adore mm -hmm. how she's written because well, I'd, I'd so, crack too. Yeah. she's right <laughs> everyone has such good ways of re she's seen some shit mm -hmm. like and this is still yet more shit that she has to yeah. see <laughs> um yeah no i don't know i i think that yeah yeah can I, I blow God. all of your minds sure. right now? Please do. So I'm going to talk about how Annihilation is consi is connected to another movie that you might not entirely expect. Okay, go. So obviously with the Shimmer, over time is growing and there's the threat that it could potentially encompass the whole world if left alone for long sure. enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that were to happen, dynamic cellular change in all creatures and plants and everything would happen. I'm trying to figure and out where this is going. <laughs> so I think when you're thinking about that, you're like, huh, I wonder what would the world look like if things progressed that far and if the shimmer was allowed to change everything enough? Like, where would things end up? And... 
as you follow the trail further and further and further, and you think about it more and more, there actually was a movie already made about that progress. Enter Cars. Oh my fucking God. (laughs) (laughs) Cars is the perfect movie for... Jeff is like so disgusted with me right Wait, okay, now. so so that's why there's no humans. Yeah. Yeah, because they were all merged with the cars. They merged with their cars. Yeah. And that's why there's so many car shaped so, uh, rock out. Okay, hold on. So oh that God, means that so, means that in the so movie right. cars, inside every car, if you were to like just open up a door, you would find not not necessarily a wall guy, but a car seat guy. Yeah, that's what I think. And just yeah, just yeah. melted like into the interior of, like, of the car spread around. Yeah, or mo- moving around internal organs, Ooh. you know, kind of like Lightning McQueen guy. just has oh. intestines <laughs> writhing like eels out on his seats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I want to. I want to go back. I want to rewind. I, I want to. Believe... I want to pretend that that never happened. <laughs> wow. I want to go. I want to go back to something Jeff was saying. Um, <laughs> Things so... nobody has ever said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just that uh, I feel like I was being really dismissive of what you were saying. I um, felt like you were engaging with my be... ideas intellectually in the manner that you should have and that you were just choosing to disagree, which I respect it to just for the record. I appreciate it. I'm going to say that while that is true, I the premise that I am disagreeing on is that this my personal read disagrees with that. But I don't think that that's out of line necessarily with what the movie is saying i think that when it comes to trying to take a cohesive read out of it on my viewing this time around um for that read to have maximum impact i personally need her to still be the same person she was going in just massively changed oh, sure sure, sure um, but... but that doesn't necessarily mean that the movie is point blank in the text saying that she's the same person i think that there's a lot of reasons why it could be and i also think that there's definitely some other stuff to say that it might sure. not well be. i'm also so. just uh to, to be fair and also to try and like you know maybe merge our theories a little bit um since you were talking about her wanting to go and experience the thing that he experienced so she could be changed the way that he was changed, if she comes back and she's John Carpenter's The Thing, doesn't that mean that she has changed to be the most like him that she possibly could? She got exactly what she wanted, but it's not what she wanted. Isn't Mm -hmm. that like... I think that's interesting as well. I think that that can also, but if you read it the other way where she's not, I think it's interesting to think that no matter how much you can try to experience the exact same thing that someone else did, Mm. because they've already gone through and you know they already Mm. have, you can never quite get exactly right because you are still different people ultimately. Yeah. Mm hmm. So I don't know. I just, I, the really, all the relationships in this movie are really interesting. And here's one thing on the angle of like when I first watched this and was reading really hard into the Doomer self destruction um, angle somewhere between Ventress and Josie, um, I, always wondered how Cassie was supposed to fit into that because Mm. all of them are self-destructing in some way and they all kind of meet an end that um, fits them. Cassie is interesting because there are two ways for me to read it. One is that because she is already accepted as much as she can in her actual real life, there is nothing for us to really learn from her in the story. Um, except that she still has something to lose and it's her dignity as she dies. Um, (laughs) Jesus. And the second read... (laughs) Sorry. And the second read is that she is not as strong as she's letting off. Her clinical kind of diagnosis of everyone in the party Mm. um, is her being extremely cynical and a little bit kind of patronizing to everyone else in the group. A good bit. She's yeah. talking about them yeah. like they're just things with descriptions. Everyone has their yeah. thing. Very, very much rocket in the first. Oh, yeah, we all got yeah dead very people. much. Especially the way she talks about <laughs> Anya. The way she says Anya's a former addict. The way that she says it specifically is Anya is sober, therefore an addict. It's mm-hmm. like, it's, it's fucking so... BBC Sherlock shit. It's <laughs> like, so, yeah, it's so detached. Yeah, and I think detached that. Detached is a way better I... word. Yeah. She's trying to connect, but in a way that makes it seem like she, it's, I don't think it's purposefully manipulative, but both she and Ventress, everyone kind of tries to collect, connect to Lena like they get her more than anyone else, except for Josie. 
Um, and I, I think Cassie and Ventress do it the most. Um, and I think that Cassie ha- being taken forcefully by this change instead of everyone else who Ooh. kind of comes across it in their own time. I think that's a direct confrontation to her kind of acting like she's already got it all figured yeah. out is the, the shimmer being like, no, you don't. I follow that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, either read I think is really interesting, but my initial read had been um, just that we have nothing to learn from her and no- there is nothing for her to show us except for that she still has something to lose. But I think I like this version better, which is that if you think that you have already got all the change in your life and that you are not going to have to deal with any more change and everyone else is struggling, but you're not, life is going to absolutely kick you in the nose about it. Yeah. Mm. I have another theory. Okay. No, no. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, Kane's accent. Right, right. Which okay. we've, right, all, right. we've all talked about is bad. It's a bad accent. It's bad southern accent. accent. I never noticed the accent very much until the end of the movie. Me neither. Uh, question: Did end you the say recording. accent on purpose I, or I, no? That was that was an accident. <laughs> um, Ooh, an accent accident. <laughs> an accent accident. <laughs> um, I didn't notice it until the end of the movie in the recording where he's talking to himself and has the phosphorus bomb. Me too. I literally texted Noah so, and I was like, "Has he had this the whole time?" <laughs> exactly. So. I'm thinking, what if it was an intentionally bad accent that he's like, I'm going to have this copy of me think that I have this terrible southern accent so that it takes that and just continues life with this horrible fucking accent. Kane, like many military men, a true poster to the end. So yeah, yeah, I subscribe like, to that I'm theory. I'm, I'm taking that one, yeah. yeah. I feel like... The first, the first theory I had, one hundred percent a joke. This is like fifty percent a joke, fifty percent. But <laughs> but what? But kinda, when I tell people about it in the future, I'm gonna be a hundred percent serious. Yeah, I'm gonna be dead serious. <laughs> this is this is what I'm going all in on from here on out. <laughs> That's something I would do. Uh, okay, so when faced with the unknowable entity be- beneath the lighthouse, I would put make on a, a fake accent. accent. <laughs> um all right so now that we're cracking jokes again um i'm gonna talk about a couple of just like little details and stuff that i don't want to spend a huge amount of time on necessarily um rainbows good luck with that rainbows fucking everywhere in this movie right um when 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 kane like drinks his water at the at the beginning of the movie and he sets it down and it's got his blood in it there's a rainbow in the glass like a stripe going vertically you saw this I, I think they like just put a light behind the glass in a particular way or some shit like that. Unless that just got added digitally, which I hope it didn't. But um, that's like one of the first rainbows you see in this. And you see them like literally fucking everywhere. And all the water looks like it's got oil on it. Every cloud is casting rainbows through it. Like it is absolutely everywhere. And I love it. Um, the soundtrack. It's, it's real, real, real good. But here's the thing. It's so it's, good. It, it meshes with the overall aesthetic and atmospheric feel of the movie so much that I literally barely noticed any of it at all until earlier mm-hmm. this afternoon when I was listening to the soundtrack by itself because I was like, I feel like I should have thoughts about this soundtrack for any reason other than the final scene, the the climactic thing with the creature. But like, I can't think of what any of it sounds like other than that Crosby, Stills and Nash song. So I went and listened to it, and every track that came up, I was like, yeah, this is perfectly familiar. I've definitely heard this three times. Why can I not, like, place there being Picture music the in any of these scenes? It's because I imagine the entire, like, audiovisual experience of every scene as a single mass. I don't pull it apart into separate things. It meshes that well. Okay, but here's the thing. The two guys who wrote it, whose names are escaping me suddenly, so I have to pull them up on my phone. Um, shit. <laughs> uh, the, the, one, the one's name is Ben Salisbury, and he actually is known, or, well, not known necessarily, but he, his career has been primarily doing soundtracks to nature documentaries and such. 
You know what? That makes Doesn't sense. Doesn't that make that perfect make sense. sense for what so much of this those movie Those are also is. things that just are supposed to disappear into the environment. Right, and also so much of this movie visually is focused on just showing us what the place looks like. I mm-hmm. love how much time this movie spends just kind of letting you appreciate the scenery, and yet it does this without it being at the expense of the narrative actually moving. It does this so well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then the... So, the wait. The, yeah, ah, yeah, what? Go ahead. No, just really quick. The kind of music that um, I assume is uh, Ben Salisbury because the other guy's list is a DJ. Yeah. Um, the kind of guitar music is the same stuff that I... It's very similar to a band that I used to listen to when my family would go to the San Juan Islands or specifically San Juan Island um, proper um, off the coast of Washington State. Um, and those are like some of just the calmest, like most existential moments of my mm-hmm. life where I just kind of let myself exist uh, because I had no pressing like anything. Right. And that's the kind of music that I listened to. What so I think that's another part of like why this, it was a uh, radical face. Oh, okay. Not one that I recognize. Um, yeah. Uh, the guy's name is yeah, Jeff a, Barrow. That's Jeff with a G. Jeff with a G. Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the the two of them absolutely killed it with this, though. And then when we get to that big climactic scene with the creature, the music is suddenly like the least human shit you've ever heard. It doesn't sound like any instrument you can actually play. It's obviously like digitally synthesized. And I don't know what the hell they did to make it sound like that, but it's incredible. It's so mm-hmm. good. It's just it's got this weird like. I don't know, kind of brassy kind of bowed kind of attack to it the way that it like hits and sustains it's just it's so cool anyone wondering it is the uh a lot of that is used in the trailers as well so you've definitely heard a lot of these sounds Mm. in in the trailers also i I love that unfortunately the creature song which is one of the best songs on the soundtrack and is very like emotional to me did also get turned into a tiktok meme and i hate it yeah that's very annoying it really ruins the impactfulness of that scene it hasn't because um i refuse to let it but it it is in denial (laughs) it does bug me though in a big way but it so much of it is just it's that so it's good. like the culmination of the movie, right? The the culmination of oh, this yeah. massive atmospheric experience that you've just been taking in for the last hour and 50 minutes by the time you get to that point. And then you get those weird ass noises and you're like, oh, fuck. And you're looking at all this crazy shit on the screen and you're like, oh, God. And no, I was not <sighs> reacting like that because I was high while I was watching it. I was sober both times. <laughs> so hmm. most of, of both times. OK, you the- got me. <laughs> The weird shit that happens near the end yeah. there. Um, to take it back to being serious right, right. for just a second. Um, I think the creature of the alien is really interesting mm-hmm. um, because uh, I I interpreted it and then I realized at the end of the movie that this was an entirely personal thing and not in the text at all. Um, I think it's really interesting to see Lena and this thing interact with each other because they both seem like curious. Yeah. Um, I it kind of feels like two almost like two scientists interacting with Just each other. Just figuring it out. Um figuring it out. Um, especially because it doesn't attack her. She shoots right. at it and it just kind of takes it. And she has to, um, in a very like old school, like fairy tale fable way, trick it into dying. Yeah. Um and I think it's so interesting how oh god the back to lena and kane again um i think it's interesting how kane told his his um copy to go back to lena and it does but it doesn't know why yeah, yeah. it's following instructions it doesn't it, it it seems it's not like trust or anything it seems almost robotic but yeah. it doesn't not have a consciousness it does start to think for itself it does answer her question in a way that seems very human she's like was it covert and he's like he wants to please her he's like i don't yeah, know and she's it seems like, like come he's on. trying he's to like, give her the answer that she will want but he doesn't know yeah. what that really Why? means kind of like um in one of the interview scenes where the the guy's like oh so you lied to the rest of the team to get them to go further into the shimmer and she says i didn't know what going back meant I didn't know why that would be safer than just to keep going forward. It's like mm-hmm. like you still have all the words and the me and like you you still have the meanings that they come with and the actions that you take to go along with them but just without the comprehension of the idea. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's so interesting because then when Lena and her copy only brush hands for a moment, Mm. I love its expression when it does. It seems confused. It seems like a little a little bit sad it only gets a few things from her it seems like because again when it catches on fire the first thing it reaches for is Cain and I I take that to mean that in that moment she was thinking so hard about getting about him about what he must be about getting back to him that that was her driving force as it has been this whole movie um and I think going back to that the fact that the two of them reunite, having gone through all of this and have and knowing that they are not the same, and that the, when when he when they say, "Oh, Kane's in isolation," and she says, "So am I," they are the only two people who on in the entire world who've experienced this. Uh-huh. So, despite knowing that the other is not the same to them, like Lena's still human, it's still pretty much entirely not like to to except that it's kind of interesting going back to how she's been um it's like why would you choose to stay with someone who's cheated on you she she has cheated on him but they have still they've done so much she's done so much work to reconcile with him and the two of them are so different they still despite everything have experiences that only the other person will understand and that is the reason why even if they aren't going to stay together like romantically with all of the things that have transpired they still go to each other and hug each other and have that connection despite all this weird shit because it's they're still important to each other and i really like that too Uh, does somebody other than me want to talk about something for a couple minutes before I get into my next thing? Let me um, think. Let me think. No, I, quick, just, I don't want this about? whole episode to uh, just be me and Nina bouncing off of each other and then nothing else, <laughs> you know? Yeah. See, you all are great with the like high concept conversations and I'm good for like the jokes and for a few quick thoughts every now and then. Um... Let me think. I read, so the uh, cancer cell study she was teaching about at the beginning of the movie, this is more just a fun slash interesting fact, was from like a uh, pretty well-known like cancer patient case where they basically, she did not give permission for like her cells and stuff to be studied to this extent um henrietta lack ever and yeah and there was a book written about it and at the beginning of the movie main character girl was shown reading that book yeah very neat cool reference Hmm. just a yeah it's really neat interesting connection and speaking of Um, references you've just set me up for my next thing (laughs) this movie is chock full of old-timey sci-fi references um, really? So the story is, of course, not dissimilar from H.P. Lovecraft's uh, The Color Out of Space, as has been pointed out many times, of course. Yeah. Um, but also it has very, very specific references to stuff by uh, J.G. Ballard and Samuel Beckett. Specifically, the names of the characters, Ventress, Thorinson, Shepard, and Raddick, uh are Uh, references to those all did sound like references they are yeah they are references (laughs) to a book called the crystal world by jg ballard and that's where those crystal trees on the beach come from as well Mm -hmm. um in the the scene where uh what lena is going down into the chamber under the lighthouse and she finds ventress and ventress we get this brief scene where ventress is sitting alone and her face is all weird she doesn't have eyes And she's saying some very enigmatic things. And then Lena comes in and gets her attention and she turns around and her face is normal again, right? What she says there is unfathomable mind, now beacon, now see. And that is from Samuel Beckett's book, Malloy, in which apparently the main character is tracked down by another character and their identities, quote, appear to merge toward the end of the story. Mm. Um... Also, shit, wait. Had okay, something so question, else, but... why did she have no eyes and then turned around and yeah, she I had eyes I again? What's, what I don't get what's going that? on with that, personally. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure what's happening in that scene. 
Nina, do you have any insights? Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no insights. <laughs> All right, so my last reference point, I mentioned... That'll be one for a future watch, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I mentioned genetic research, and I said that I was going to talk about the Infinity Loop Ouroboros tattoo that a couple of characters mm. uh, ambiguously have at points of the movie. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Lena does not have this early in the movie. Anya does not have this early in the movie. It appears on both of them while they're in the Shimmer. Um, mm -hmm. Does Anya not have it before she the Shimmer? She does not. No. Oh. Does uh, she... They get it from the <gasps> from wall the, boy. From the wall, wall man. Guy yeah. Oh my God. Okay, but they don't get it from him necessarily, I don't think. I think it's kind of just a thing that the, it just appears the Shimmer on is doing. Okay, eventually. but here's the thing. It's an Ouroboros tattoo. As a reference... To the Ouroboros gene, which is a mutation that was discovered by a group of French researchers in 2011, um, which, let's see, it was a mutation found uh, at first in a brown algae called Ectocarpus, and this organism has a two-stage life cycle with each phase producing a different form of the organism at a genetic level. The French scientists identified a, muta a mutation, which they referred to as the Ouroboros, that allows the sporophyte phase to mimic the gametophyte phase, which of course is something that we all know about, right? Um, oh, you're yeah. just and saying what it's like. This causes honestly. the organism to exist as a continuous gametophyte stays, phase, and this is similar to other homeotic mutations that can cause specific organs to mutate into different organs, such as, for an example, antennae in fruit flies converting to become legs. However, the Ouroboros mutation affects the entire organism and not just a single organ. So essentially, these, this is a, a, a mutation gene that causes mutations like in kind of a similar manner to the shimmer in this movie. Interesting. Isn't that fucking hmm. a deep cut, right? Like, that's crazy talk. That is yeah. a stupid yeah, deep cut. Yeah, ridiculous, that's isn't it? That really is a cool. stupid deep cut. It makes sense, though, because, like, if you're gonna... It's kind of like um, The Last of Us mm. and how mm -hmm. they, they draw comparison to the kind of real-life um quote unquote well not quote unquote the cordyceps you know, yeah. example of the cordyceps yeah Terrifying. um because that's what science fiction is all about right is like hey this happens on a small scale what if we just fucking blew that shit yeah. up <laughs> and i love that i i love that very much if i were better at science i would love to to explore that but i am very bad at science um <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so this is interesting talking about references yeah. jeff um I saw some Reddit film bros who I disagree with Naturally. talking about how this movie rips off a 19... Whew, let me look up when this movie came out. Is it... 1979 movie, um, Stalker by Tarkovsky, directed by Tarkovsky. Um, Andre Tarkovsky. Fucking... Uh, it's a 1979 sci-fi that has similarities in plot. I've not seen it. Was that um, one also based on a my, book by any chance? Yeah, it was based on a Russian short story, I think. I'm hold on, sorry. I'm I'm frantically attempting Roadside Picnic is the story it looks yes. like. I, I am trying frantically to pull up the Alex Garland interview that I was quoting from earlier because Please he do. talked about this actually in that. Okay, good. Good. Cuz Reddit film bros were like, "Uh, it's just it's just another soft uh reboot disguised as an original." And I'm like, "You guys are so Are they, they aware that things can be similar without being ripping something right? off?" Well, like And they're calling it creatively bankrupt because they said the ending basically ripped off Blade Runner, and I'm like, "You guys are idiots. No, it didn't. I'm I sorry. literally just watched mm. Blade Runner, and it didn't. <laughs> Also, uh, yeah, this is just a, a mid-session ghoul it's that giving I'm going to um, Wait, let me yeah, finish my it. joke. Uh, it's, giving, it's giving guy who's only seen Boss 100%, baby, yeah, these guys have only I watched Blade Runner. <laughs> okay, so going into Blade... The only thing I'm going to say about Blade Runner is going into it, one thing that I knew about it was that it was known for the, like, having a Vangelis soundtrack and the, the soundtrack being, like, a big thing. But after watching so many like Argento movies with goblin scores and stuff, I spent the entire movie just being like, oh man, Vangelis just kept writing music and Ridley Scott just kept telling them to dial it back, huh? Because I felt like they were so muted compared to like what I'm used to. 
<laughs> that's so rough. I've never heard anything about Blade Runner soundtrack, though. I don't think that that's oh, really? something that I generally no. That's honestly, something that I have heard, but oh, okay. I've seen a lot of shots. I've seen a lot of discussion about themes. I have not heard much about the soundtrack, but that might just be the circles mm-hmm. that we run in being different. Can I talk about bears? Talk about the bear. Yes, but Jeff, while I look for Jeff, this if thing. you find anything about Stalker, yeah, let I'll, me know. I'll get there eventually. It might yeah. not be in this interview. It might be in something else that I was reading, but I will be able to find it easily enough. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the scarier things about this movie is the the skull bear obviously it's Mm -hmm. iconic um she slayed she did also um off topic i found myself mentally referring to the alien as a she throughout the entirety of the movie this time around and i nice i I like that (laughs) i love that um so one of the creepy things about bears that this bear also seemed to do um is bears, when they attack you, like, they do not kill you and then eat you. They just, they just start, start eating, eating you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And while they were tied in the chairs and the bear just walks up to the girl, just starts, like, chowing mm-hmm. down. It's like, no, that's uncomfortable and I don't yeah. like that. Yeah, um, no, that one did get yeah. me. Bears are terrifying. Also, fun fact about the bear, um, the effects guys had a name for it because effects guys very frequently name their projects. And they decided to name Mm -hmm. this bear sort of sarcastically after Paddington. But okay, so the way that Paddington the bear got named was... uh, It's after the train station. Paddington is named after the train station. So instead of naming this bear after a nice train station for a nice bear... They picked a really rough part of London and named the bear after a train station from there. So this bear's name is Homerton. Amazing. That That reminds me of the only reason that the fish man from uh, Shape of Water Mm. Water has a name is because the effects guys named him Charlie after the tuna from the tuna company. Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay, so I have found stuff about Roadside Picnic and Stalker. Uh, Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote the book, um, has, uh, you know, w- was asked about it and said that the original novel, at least, is 100% nothing to do with uh, Roadside Picnic or Stalker, but rather draws its influences more primarily from writers like J.G. Ballard and Franz Kafka. So you oh, might say that this movie it is, is Kafka. <laughs> um so yeah the the one thing that i think is a major change i read the plot synopsis for stalker Mm. i do intend to watch it does it look similar to you um so yeah so here's a synopsis a basic general synopsis for stalker um there's a weird zone tm that people can go into there is a room at the center of the zone and it is said that when you get into the room you get your deepest desire and it follows a group of people going into this zone to get to this room um and learning things about themselves and each other is like get they get there and then um one of them is like, I'm going to blow it up, actually. Oh, sure. And then they get there and learn that the room doesn't actually grant you what you ask. It grants your heart's greatest desire. Oh. Um, and so it's not actually a danger if someone evil were to get their hands on it because it's not going to grant the thing the person asks for. Um, so he dismantles the bomb. Uh, and then none of them go in because they're all like, this is actually, we don't know what we want. And this might fuck our shit up. And so they all just leave. That's um, cool. <laughs> That's yeah, pretty no. cool, and um, also not very similar, I don't think. Not very similar, <laughs> apart from the... Um, some people said they saw structure similar, like shot similarities that maybe Garland like took okay, inspiration sure. from, possibly. Um, but other than that, it's just the structure of weird zone with a room in the Lots center. Lots of stories involve um, weird zones with rooms at the center, and even with a well, room that has some kind of specific effect when you reach it, like... Some people could, you could argue that specifically for Ventress and Lena, maybe not for everyone else, Mm. they are going to this like room hoping that it will solve their issues. Um, 
cancer and Cain, respectively. So you could argue that there's like your deepest desires there, I guess. But personally, I think it's just an interesting concept. And sometimes it's okay to throw completely different characters into similar situations to see because the story is going to be completely yeah. different based on who's telling it, what the characters are, yada, yada, yada. So even similarities aren't the fucking end no, of the world. Everything has similarities to things. It's almost as if there's a lot of art and things can only do so much stuff. And in fact, speaking of that, um, I would like to issue a formal apology to anyone who is going to read my second book. Um, I may or may not have ripped off this movie. Oh, no. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> I'm hype. I'm calling it a tribute. There we go, yeah. Um, but you will, you will know it when you see it because I... I my thought process was I am going to write it without watching the movie and then I was like no I want to watch the movie to make sure I don't rip it off too much and so I watched the movie and then my thought process was this is too beautiful I have to write exactly this um so basically mm. I did a novelization of that of the scene I wanted as practice and then I basically just kept that um I did I did change a lot of it. I think when you read it, you'll be like, oh, this is like very clearly a tribute, but it is very clearly like a tribute. There is no r wiggle room. There's even some dialogue that's very Ooh. similar. So yeah, you guys got that to look forward to. I'm pretty to excited for it. Um, my editor, who has not seen Annihilation, I do not think, has think praised has. the scene every time she has read this book. She has read this book three Ooh. times and she has <laughs> gone on about, well, the whole chapter and there is stuff leading up to it that is not Annihilation Every time all. that she talks but, about the book, she asks me if I had an ARC copy of it and every time I'm like, no, I'm not an ARC reader. Why would I have that? <laughs> and every it time been. it just slips her it mind that that's be. not something I would do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Very, very funny to me. She just likes it that much. I, she just I wants think. to talk. Yeah, she to, wants she people wants to talk to, to, talk to about, about it, it and <laughs> and I'm not gonna do it anymore. <laughs> I find it too stressful. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So, um, I don't know. That's just where I, I also like. I don't want. I I used to say I didn't want to get pop culture tattoos, but now that I have the malignant tattoo. I am fully more, yeah. like starting to <laughs> construct in my mind where to put the Ouroboros tattoo. Um, you want to get an Ouroboros mm, tattoo? In the same spot. What? Not just, yeah, for the movie. Jeff. Well, Come on, but this is up. my color arm. Oh. <laughs> uh. So. <laughs> uh, and I already have a tattoo in the spot on the black and white arm, wow. and that's where I wanted that one. Um, so I might just have to interrupt the color arm with a giant black and white Ouroboros <laughs> and call it good. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna do it in the infinity loop shit yeah. i'm assuming yeah just i pretty much feel like the one from the movie is the one that i'm gonna try and emulate okay. but i am gonna try not to do it beat for beat oh, sure. i might do the circular shape just to like it, it pull it away from being influenced by the movie in case something happens and my oh, sure. memory of this movie is somehow tainted a la baby driver my other favorite right. movie um but I do. I, I used to plan on getting one that was like wrapped actually around my arm. Ooh. Oh, like a like, like a yeah, like band. it's a band, but like, it's the Ouroboros snake. Yeah. I thought that would be pretty cool. That's cool. I, I am no longer planning cool. on doing that. So if you want to, you know. Ooh, maybe I'll steal that. No one else listening can yeah, steal nobody that. Yeah, nobody else nobody it's you didn't now. hear that. You didn't I'm, hear I'm that. I'm gonna at cut all. it out <laughs> so you can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be a really funny one if you just leave it of course honestly. i'm gonna leave it <laughs> i'm gonna cut that part though where i say that does anyone want anything uh want to say anything could i have a coke before noah's notes um, i don't have a coke i have dr pepper in the fridge though do you want oh i'll take I, uh, yeah noah absolutely. bought me a take liter dr. dr pepper, pepper on his way home from work so i have a liter of dr nice. pepper all to myself. gonna heat it up what a what a man! Oh, I should make hot Dr Pepper. It's already way too hot in this fucking house. I'm sweating. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's pop on over yeah, to let's Noah's do notes. That. Let's this, do it. This is the part of the episode where I'm gonna probably talk a little bit more because what it's always happens is I um. Usually, you say I'm, the thing in your notes, right? Yeah. Yeah. We just. Yeah, we just record at terrible times for me anymore because I am so much less available, and that's my fault. I but don't think man, that's I'm, your fault. You I just can't have think a of a, job, a single like... thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, but 
I'm, let me rephrase. Uh, it's my lack of availability we're working around, which makes it my fault, which means I forget anything I'm going to say until we get to the Noah's Notes section, and then I go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thing. <laughs> Can like, I interrupt with a quick bit of good news? Yeah. Of course. Um, Evil Dead Rise has beaten Shazam Fury of the Gods as Warner Bros. highest grossing 2023 release Yo, globally. All right. Oh, all right. If, if it didn't, that would have been a big bummer. <laughs> yeah. Huge bummer. But it had a $19 million budget and it was a Shazam was um, much higher, I assume. It's yeah. It's at a hundred and forty one million. Yeah, that's what I'm talking or about. Po- or potentially slightly over two hundred million. That's what I'm it's talking about. It's a little about. confusing to tell. Evil Dead. Evil Dead. Yeah, it's already what? It it's is it the most profitable Evil Dead movie, or did it just beat out 2013? Because I know it beat out 2013, but... Honest, well, I I feel like it would be hard not to be percentage-wise more profitable than the first one. Well, yeah, because it got made mm-hmm. for, like, negative but, money, practically. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, though, let's, let's hit these notes. Let's hit these notes. Yeah. Okay. It's my turn to engage now. Okay. So Noah says, um, I'm going to read some just blanket note actual notes noah says my god the opening with the lighthouse just sitting there it goes so hard knowing what the movie comes to Uh uh-huh i remember getting blindsided by where this movie was actually going versus what i anticipated based off my minimal memories of the trailers Mm. yeah i didn't even see trailers i I remember remember seeing the trailers and being like oh my god that looks like it's gonna be so cool and then watching it and being like oh this is not what i expected at all because the trailers made it look like it was just gonna be like natalie portman being badass for the most part. Mm-hmm. And not that mm-hmm. it isn't, oh. but like that's really not the focus of this. It seems a lot like less... Like Lara Croft. Um, no, no, not like that level, but it seems a lot less trippy than the movie actually yeah. is. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah, again, I had no idea what you I was You knew it would be cosmic. Into. You didn't know how not grounded it would be, though. Right, I think that was yeah. the main thing. Uh, I just want to point out, I love having seen the movie before... The pit of my stomach dread I feel when Kane walked into the bedroom mm. because he's standing there just dead to the world, super like non responsive. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy shit, that's because it's not him and he doesn't really know what's going on. Uh, Evil Dead Rise becomes franchise's highest grossing film globally. It like it freaked me out, man. That's what you think uh, about when six. you see him walk in that bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. oh my god, Evil Dead Rise. It uh, <laughs> yeah, it is uh, the highest grossing film, though, that Nina just ah, found. Okay. But, yeah. you know, he walks into the room, and it's just like, he's there, he is non-responsive, and she just, like, tackles him with a hug, and he's just, like, blank slate, nothing yeah. happening, barely, like, one or two word responses to her at the table is just neat. Yeah. It's so interesting the different, like, I don't, I wish I remembered more of how I felt watching this movie the first time because I don't. I I just know that I came away from it and I liked it, but I didn't even love it that much. I just thought like, wow, that was a good movie. And then I think the second viewing, knowing where it was going is I think when I was like, oh my God. It's like I said earlier, it's a rewatcher. (laughs) You just, you got to watch it a couple Mm -hmm. of times. It's actually not too dissimilar from another cosmic horror movie, The Void. Which is like, I'm not going to talk about it for too long, but it's just like, it's so dense that it's overwhelming the first time you watch it. And I think that's intentional. Like, it it just kind of keeps hitting you until it's over. But then on the second watch, you're like, you already know things. And you're like, oh, okay. And you like, you follow it way better. And there's a lot of like cool shit in the beginning that you don't actually catch because you were too busy trying to figure out what was happening. Very, very cool. We should cover that sometime actually yeah t- absolutely uh this movie to me does yeah. that too because as i i was saying like i i remember every scene of this movie every time i watch it i still am enjoying the watch and i'm still every time i rewatch it i forget how openly everyone like looks at the camera and says things change self-destruction <laughs> i don't want to die like that um yeah. <laughs> I always, I'm always like, wow, the themes of this movie are so deep, and then I forget that the movie outright states them. Um, but I also, the only scene that I did not remember 100% this time around was 
finding Cassie's body. I did not remember that that mm. happened. I remembered that the deer scene happened, but I didn't remember when. So I was like, oh, this is when the deer scene happens. Oh, there's Cassie's body. Forgot yeah. about that. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, uh, I wish I remembered being confused on my first round of this movie, but I remember where I saw it. And I remember a lot of the concert after, but I don't remember my experience watching it. Was the concert um, good? It was, it was great. Uh, my memory's been tainted because I got too familiar with the artist personally and uh, they kind of turned out to be a oh, dick. So uh, I can't listen to that band Bummer. anymore. It sucks. But the concert was great though. Uh, Noah says, honestly, came back the came back wrong trope is about to be the thing in life I'm conceptually the most scared of. Came back wrong is such a good trope. It's so good. I love it so much. It's um, the foundation of the horror short stories that I write. Um, it, the first one I ever wrote was a came back wrong um, one. And I, I just like, ooh, it's just so good. I love how different it can be for different people. But just that that moment early on of him just not quite being there is yeah. so good. I actually have a concept mm -hmm. for a short story that I'm going to try and get Becca to write for me because I'm not a writer that is a came back wrong <laughs> story. And I just think the idea is too good to not use it. Um, obligatory shitting on sibling Jeff using Becca like an AI oh, generator. I was gonna oh. say, didn't we just have a conversation about? No, I'm, I'm I write kidding. music for her um, sometimes. It's like a trade. It's just <laughs> yeah. I did Noah's fucking a uh, uh, stream layout, yeah. and I assume that will be paid off at some point. Wow, you're on his <laughs> podcast. What more wow. do you want? <laughs> That's how we met. I was doing him a favor right. at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I knew that. <laughs> Just a real uh, podcast or I uh, Noah. Noah says, um, there's just a lot of talk about, um, because this movie does happen so fast, um, there's a lot of just stuff about like the, the rainbow reflections mm -hmm. and the refractions and the, and the plants. And then there's just big boy. He's a big boy. <laughs> He's a big boy. Um, uh, Noah says, uh, first sighting of the tattoo. Mm -hmm. um, and then I like how it draws our attention to her arm and the bruise to show she doesn't have the tattoo here in past recollections. That's very funny. I hate that moment. I think that's another one of the weaknesses for me is like, oh, the bruise. Look at my arm. There's a bruise. There's no tattoo, though, and you can see I, because there's a bruise. I like it, though. It just feels a, a little I obvious, like it because it's like kind of nothing and it goes nowhere. But then later on when you see the tattoo and you're like, hey, was that there earlier? You got a scene where you saw it and you can be like, oh, she right didn't. and a hundred percent that was that was just mm -hmm. the beginnings of this tattoo appearing on her arm yeah because i would i would a hundred percent assume that the tattoo had just been there the whole time if i saw it in that scene so i would a hundred percent just assume i had missed it so this is one of those things where this movie is very very again blatant about everything that it's trying to do it just says it out loud um, and then the stuff that's up to interpretation is really up to interpretation um but with this moment um I, I understand why the decision was made. I think it's, as a writer, I understand that it's, like, really hard to tell when you're dropping hints hard enough mm. um, because um, sometimes you're like, wow, I'm being so obvious about something and people will still come and ask you questions about it. And it's like, yeah. they're like, oh, what does it mean that this, that, and the other thing? And I'm like, oh, Did my I God, I thought that it was out? so like, obvious. <laughs> Um, so I understand why they did it. I just personally think it's really funny on rewatches when you do know to, to kind of take that moment and be like, oh my God, my arm, oh. look at it, look at it in its full glory <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I like a setup and then a sort of understated payoff. Shekhov's arm. Would you like just the, 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 the tattoo appearing goes like unremarked on entirely by anybody. Mm-hmm. I, I like that. Yeah. I like the, the subtlety of it. It is it is really fun. Agreed. Subtle it is I think it's a good example of this movie's idea of subtlety, yeah. which is that if you're paying attention it feels unsubtle, but there is a possibility that you will miss everything yeah. if you are not paying attention. Well, and just like I feel um, like I mean, you know, like you said, so much of it is so overt, but then the stuff that's up to interpretation is incredibly ambiguous. I, I feel like with the knowledge of some of the larger parts of the movie having such a degree of ambiguity, 
they probably felt like they needed to make some things overt, you know? Mm-hmm. That makes mm-hmm. a lot the of sense. The in the back. <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> Noah says, um, even all the shots outside the mess hall are so colorful. Obviously, swampy areas have some great colors anyway, mm. but there's just something that feels different about these. Um, probably because they're all in specific areas that are usually all bland in cement. I love how vibrant the greens yeah. are mm-hmm. in the in that scene. Yeah, 100%. we we missed probably fifteen notes about me talking about how colorful everything is uh, up to this yeah. point. I fucking yeah. love the alone. plants in this movie. The way that like the shimmer, mm-hmm. it's it's very they're obvious. Green. The shimmer isn't killing anything. The plants are like fine. They're just weird. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. animals are behaving pretty much still like animals. Neither the bear nor the fucking alligator act in a way that I think is really weird for a bear or an alligator. Well, to it act. is weird for a gator to um, be that aggressive from what I gather, but that's just a gators in movies thing, not unique to this one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, also, it's possible that she like fucking stepped on it in there while Entirely they were like possible. rifling yeah. around. Um but yeah, the deer act like normal deer. It is. It seems like um, I've been playing a lot of Bloodborne recently. Yeah. Um, and when I started playing, when I started watching Noah play it, I remarked to him that it seemed like the beasts are pretty much just vibing on their own without the hunter fucking their shit mm. up. And then we get to old Yarnum and we meet a, hu- a, a hunter whose entire MO is that idea, is him being like, hey, can you get the fuck out of here? These beasts are just vibing on their own. Uh, it, Yarnum, I hardly know him. <laughs> <laughs> fuck she you. Yarnum on my... <laughs> Any, Anyway. Um, but yeah, no, the idea that like the we as humans have this idea that we need to control nature and that any and this plays into th- the themes of the movie as well. We need to control nature and anything that is changing in a way that we don't like is therefore mm. a bad yeah. thing. Um, but apart from some shit that we view as unnatural, life is still life yeah, in there going. just fine. Um, Better than ever with all which the means going. it's kind of like. <laughs> It's kind of like the, I think the shimmer and climate change are both very similar in that like, and I think this is why like what you were saying about society oh, yeah. is is like so interesting is like, we are afraid of the shimmer. We are afraid of climate change. We keep talking about how it could be the end of the world, but a lot of people have been like, well, it's not going to be the end of the world because there are plenty of things on earth that can survive in this extreme yeah. conditions, but it most certainly will be the end of humanity as yep. we know it. Um, and I think that that's an interesting thing here is that while it's a dangerous wilderness with threats that we have never seen before, somebody's going to be the shimmer is not. Yeah, the shimmer is not deadly in of itself any more than like some other wildland would be. It's just a little more unknown. Uh, Noah says. The intercuts from the interviews really work for me. The fact that we know whatever we're seeing here is all Lena can actually remember from the entire Mm. adventure. Yeah, I like the way that they... That's part of why I think the scenes go so quickly. (laughs) You did not? Did you not? (laughs) Apparently not. What way were you going to finish? Probably is just with the words is cool, but it's just like it just ends before my natural thought would have concluded. (laughs) That's so valid. Anyway, I really like the way that due to the way they set up camp after walking in we realize what we see is all that we've got yeah like, that's that's all yeah. we've got and because they're like well, how long do you think you were in there and she's like i don't know man like maybe yeah, she a week. says days maybe two weeks and she's like and they're like four months, four months. you were gone for four, four months, months. and we can, by the end of the movie we can tell that's how long it must have been because of how her how gaunt she is by the time that we get to the final yeah scenes. Yeah, mm-hmm. she looks visibly like drawn in a way that she just does not earlier in the story. Also, uh, Barber Noah checking in. By the way, the undercut on Anya, Anya, Anya's hair changes. <laughs> I remember it does. Yeah, I noticed oh, this. So it actually does I grow out. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's so interesting. And um, human hair grows at a rate of about a half inch a month. Everyone who's like, oh, my hair grows so fast. It's a half inch longer than it was last month. That's no, normal. that's normal. Okay. <laughs> that's normal. Everyone's hair grows like that. If it grows less than that, then you need more vitamins. Your diet sucks if your hair grows slower than that. That's normal. 
I'm sorry, that's a very huge pet peeve I have when people are like, oh, my hair grew so fast. Yeah, man, it's been a it's fucking It's almost month. like it never stops <laughs> it's not doing my that or something. <laughs> it constantly is growing. It's growing right now. Yeah, like, what are you, that Fuck guy from hell. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure whose fingernails only grow at certain times of the year for some reason? Come on. Don't even... Uh... Anyway, forgot about that guy. Now that now that we've mentioned JoJo's, that's my cue to move. Yeah, keep it on. moving here. <laughs> um, Noah says, um, uh, right. Noah says in reference to the bear, <clears throat> um, it's just repeating words that it doesn't even know, just the sounds that Cass was making, and that's like something that uh, front of the podcast Edge was yeah. talking about. Um, because she she watched this movie for the first time recently, and that's actually part of why I suggested we watch it. Um, was that like imitation without understanding is a really cool thing to see in media. And this is one of my favorite examples is because it, it doesn't seem like it's doing this to try and draw anything in or anything, even though it does work that way. Um, bears don't have that in nature. So maybe because of the, just like the, you know, the whole, um, shark and crocodile thing, maybe it is kind of like mentally mutating into something that would be similar to like an anglerfish or some other type of animal that uses imitation yeah. as like um yeah. some way to as a, yeah, lure. Like a lure predator um, of some sort yeah yeah maybe it is it is working that way um because it also seems like its other senses have died down a little bit mm. it it does not really react to people being in the room if they are not um actively making noise or yeah. movement uh it seems like it can smell okay but it's not acting the way a hungry bear would act if yeah. it can smell 100 percent good and that's because it's there's, there's a gone. couple of, yeah it's <laughs> nose is just gone it's just bone yeah it's missing the top half of yeah, its face just down to the skull God, and also the, it's eyes as we all know because there was a prop department talking yeah. about it or that That's we were a talking physical about? skull that somebody uh, It made. is a practical yeah. skull. Yeah, you no, can it's find, beautiful. You can find like BTS pictures of it and it's incredible. But also like in that scene. In full lighting, yeah. which I recommend it's, you do it's because so it's, it you can't so really good. see it. But in also the movie. like if you look closely at the bear's eye in that same scene, mm -hmm. its eye is like, it's one eye that you get a, a, a decent lighting look at is all fucked up. It's just like bouncing constantly. It doesn't look like it's moving mm -hmm. in an intentional way. It looks like it's just like twitching. Mm hmm. Yeah, because the the shimmer doesn't know what what it, an eye it understands is. form and not it doesn't function. know the point. Yeah, so, God, there's so much about that because form and yeah. function. I was uh, talking with Nina about this, and I love how we get trees, and the trees are made out of crystal. Yeah. For no discernible but reason, like trees. but they look like we get trees. people. The people are and made we out get of the plants. plants that look like yeah. people, <laughs> and it's just all this stuff where it's like it it has. All the all the building blocks, like the world is a bucket of Legos and it's putting together all the wrong color yeah. pieces. <laughs> yeah, like so how So R. E. the bear. No, sorry. Um one of the it does have a functional eye, but it is a human eye. <laughs> oh yeah, it's in Cass's the human eye. In, it's Cass's eye in the skull <laughs> that is fused to the face. Fun uh, fun fact, it does also have both the top and bottom human jaw in there. Um unpleasant. <laughs> Love, oh god, it's such it's a good so design. Good. It's I so am well done. Entranced by this thing. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Um, oh yeah, like it's that's kind of like backed up by when Josie is talking about the plant people, and she's like, they they have human construction. I bet if we were to like look really closely at these leaves, we would find human DNA because this stuff is clearly made with a human form in mind. And that's like that and the bear trying to like mimic the human speech and stuff, like the the mimicry without comprehension thing is like on a, a micro level kind of what the creature as Cain is doing, right? He doesn't know how to go mm -hmm. out into the world and be a dude, but like there he is. He's doing his best, but like he can't even convincingly get through a conversation. And that's not, and I love that that's not necessarily like a negative. Like no, he's, he's just like there. A, he's not trying way. to do anything. He's got no intentions. He's like a baby. Yeah. He'll learn and then he'll decide things because already we know that based on his motivation that, that uh, the other Kane gave him, he wants Lena and he wants like to interact yeah. with her. And his consciousness starts to develop once he starts interacting with her. I just, yeah. Anyway, um, Noah's notes. Uh, Noah says, 
the world design on this is otherworldly, honestly. Like everything we could ever want from somebody trying to showcase an unnatural corruption with a tangential grasp on what makes our world yeah. tick. It's so close, but not quite. Um, he says, and the lighthouse really looks feels like a beacon of corruption, just looking at the light shining out like it is, knowing that it's ground zero. Also, the fact that the light's shining without like actual, it shouldn't be. You know, it's not shining like a lighthouse. It's just glowing. Yeah. It's just kind of like there. Yeah. It works. Well, okay. So here's an interesting thing as well, because it's not just mimicking biological right. life. It's also mimicking structures. It's the trees that are crystal are connected to it. Um, and also the house, Lena's house is there. Yeah. I'm guessing it got that from Cain um, and reconstructed it based off of what it knew from him. Oh, um, okay. I just, it had not occurred to me that that house might've been constructed like by the, the, the shimmer. In, in I assumed that it had I, to be. I assumed that it was just a house that was there. And as a movie thing, it mirrors the layout of her house, you know? But like. I think it's too intentional. It's diegetic, huh? Honestly. <laughs> the house is diegetic. Yeah, th- oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. But I think it's too intentional. And then when you combine it with other, like, not biological things being being yeah. changed, um, I think it's possible yeah. that it created that. The creature itself doesn't look intensely like the way we would define like carbon based or anything. And she says that she doesn't know if it right. is or not. So it, it there's no limit to like what it could be able to create and destroy. Yeah. Uh, Noah says. Um, Skip that one. I just forgot. I forgot that's that okay. Kane was talking to himself in the camera. Oh. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Noah says. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to skip that whole thing. It's really cute, but he did completely forget um, and then react violently to remembering that as Kane walks around in front of the camera, <laughs> Noah's notes read, oh, fuck, that's right, him. I have notes like that like, so all the time. Just so you're oh, aware, so I, I, I'm constantly like... writing things and then midway through going like, oh, no, I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, Oh, he, so here's something I really liked. Um, the doctors talking to her in the debrief at the end are like, so what was its purpose? It came here for a reason. Yeah. It's like, it didn't, it didn't. though. No, it's it just, just here. Arrived. Which is... It's here and it's reacting to everything around it, trying to figure out what the hell is going mm-hmm. on. But it's just yeah. here. And it just happens to be foreign enough that it's changing everything around it by its mere presence. Yeah. And... But it doesn't, it's not doing anything. It's just there. That's why I'll admit that my read on it is curious is probably not correct. It's probably just trying to survive as much as anything, which is why I'm glad that um, even though Lena's cane had to die, I'm glad the other cane got out because I'm glad that some part of this like survived and continued to exist because like from this creature's point of view imagine dropping onto this planet trying to figure it out so that you have some way to continue surviving um fucking people that live on this planet are keep coming in and you don't know why and you don't know if they're here to try and kill you or they're here to try and understand you you don't know if you can use them to to continue to survive so you do your darndest and then one of them does come in and kill you but oh there's still a part of you left. Yeah. I like that. And at the same time, it kind of reminds me of like the the thing from John Carpenter's The Thing, where it's like its entire life mm. is just adaptation to its surroundings, or in this case, adaptation with its surroundings, I suppose, where it's like it's, it, it's tough to even get a handle on what this thing's sense of self would be because its existence mm-hmm. is so unlike ours, which is something else that gets said like three different times in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's unlike us. I don't know what it wants. I don't know if it wants. Ventress says, and I love that um, because of that. That doesn't. That's again not necessarily a bad mm-hmm. thing, which is why I'm excited to watch the color out of yeah. space. Is because in this movie, I get the overwhelming feel of change. Uh, this is like the big thesis, right? Change is natural. Mm-hmm. Change is not bad. Like. It is going to happen. We don't know what the outcome will be. We have no way of knowing. There's no way of trying to predict right. it. Um, but to resist change like, is folly, ultimately. To resist change is folly. To try and understand it isn't necessarily because mm-hmm. Lena goes in and learns from it and comes out changed still, but she has a greater understanding because of it. And it's like, I really like that versus so to look at something like that 
And that idea of a foreign entity, and this is the whole reason I wanted to watch this movie on this podcast, is to then look at color out of space and Lovecraft, who is famously yep. <laughs> terrified of change. I was going to say, the literal <laughs> thing that this movie is about is... Uh, <laughs> yeah so hey I'm, don't be like this yeah anyway <laughs> i'm really excited to watch color out of space and see the opposite interpretation of a very similar like concept mm -hmm. um, i know nothing next to nothing about color out of space i have and read the short uh, story it is one of two lovecraft stories it's I one read. of the ones of his that what i was really the other enjoy. one i keep meaning to reread it uh the the other one was the thing on the mm. doorstep uh, which was very you good as well. You should check out uh, a, a few others because I've got some that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Uh, if you ask me to, I'll do it. I, I, I'll find the least <laughs> racist ones. <laughs> I, I think that this is one of those situations where I'll, I'll invoke like death of the author and whatever while, while still considering like who it was that wrote it. Because I think that my era of not being willing to read his shit is pretty much over, but I'm still hesitant to just because I know that there are other authors I could be oh, reading. Totally. <laughs> it's been, like that would be more valuable and less problematic. Sure. Like I could read more Clive Barker. Absolutely. I have so much of the, I have books and of you blood should. out yeah. my ass. Um but I am also back to the understanding that the the genre was affected by him and i and i am interested as someone who's trying to write in the genre myself more that i would like i would like to know kind of at least on a like technical like grammar and like structure perspective like how does he make things scary because yeah. i remember finding the thing on the doorstep scary i haven't read that one um, yet, actually i need to is good <laughs> i like it um gave me nightmares for Ooh, real for real nice um I was still in my superstitious Christian phase. I don't know oh, yeah, why that I read counts, it. Then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it had me shaking, shuddering. I threw the book out afterward. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, that's Noah's notes. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Noah, for being here, my sleepy guy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I've been Nina. Uh, you can find me at Nina Wolverina on Twitter and Instagram where I talk about the book that I wrote, uh, the book that I have written that will come out in August, and I also do a lot of art. Um, and I also talk about this movie off and on. Um, so follow me there. I'm Noah. You can find me as Bubba Bad, B-U-B-B-A-D-A-B-A-D. I am tired enough that I forgot the thing that I have been saying for the last five years. No, so no, no. I'll just cut man. the pause out. Don't worry. Oh, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Why am I talking now? Who even knows? <laughs> Um, I'm also on Letterboxd, and you can get sneak peeks about how I feel about movies that we talk about here. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure for this one, I said that this was the best uh, ending to a movie maybe ever. Mm. Yeah, and if you follow Noah oh, on Letterboxd, you, know um, so you would have known how he felt about Evil Dead Rise before the previous episode even came out, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. It's what I said in this yeah, episode. Yeah, it was all the same things. It was very familiar to me because I follow Noah on Letterboxd, where you can find me at the fakest fan. You can also find me on Twitter at Bubba Wubba Dab and on Tumblr at What Is It You Pray For. And I'm Emma. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter at Emma Panada. I'm also writing a TCRPG called All the Witches. You can find information about that at All the Witches underscore on Twitter. And yeah, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. We really appreciate it. Uh, next time, Color Out of Space. Yeah. Look forward to it. With the and Nick will... Cage, our second Nick With Cage the movie Nick on this Cage. channel. The <laughs> Hell Nick yeah. Cage. I'm hype. We did a lot of work uh, into getting have... them into Dead by Daylight. Our... So true. That was us. That yeah. was yeah. us. Yeah. We yeah. did that. Um, but have a great one. We'll see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.